Mission Fulfillment Committee to order. <clears throat> and we will begin with uh, two board policy uh, action items that were reviewed at the May meeting. And so they are up for action this month. And I will uh, move to Provost Hansen to uh, give us some comments about the two uh, board policies. Thank you, Chair Amari. I, I, as, as the Chair noted, you reviewed these already. They're, they're fairly minor changes, and uh, we talked about the rationale for the changes last time, but Julie Showers is here to answer questions on the first policy, if you have any questions about it, and, and um, Meredith McQuaid is not available, but I can answer questions on the second policy, uh, if you have any questions about that, the uh, policy on international affairs. So we will take them uh, separately. Uh, the, the first one is there a motion to recommend adoption of proposed amendments to Board of Regents policy equity, diversity, equal opportunity, and affirmative action. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Second policy, I would entertain an emo um, a motion to recommend adoption of proposed amendments to Board of Regents policy, international education and engagement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. At this time, I will, uh, excuse me, I will also turn back to Provost Hansen for uh, a very important uh, conversation, which is a progress update from the system-wide uh, enrollment planning task force. This is a discussion item, uh, and we have allotted a 30-minute time frame for uh, presentation and 25 for discussion, and I anticipate that board members will be very interested and engaged in this topic. Provost Hansen. Thank you, Chair Murray, and uh, members of the committee. We are very happy to have this opportunity to provide an update on this hardworking task force's progress. And uh, you'll hear today about the status of the system enrollment plan uh, and that it's nearing completion. Each campus, of course, has its own history of enrollment management, including specific and evolving strategies and actions related to recruitment, admission, retention, and graduation. But these campus plans have been largely siloed, and there has been, hitherto, less thought about what each campus's plan's implications are for the other campuses, and what coordinated enrollment planning might mean for the goal of one university. So that's changing. We've been spurred by the, the board's expectation of a system-wide strategic plan, um, but changes were in fact al already also underway. There has been for some time a genuine spirit of collaboration across the campuses among relevant staff. The colleagues charged with admissions responsibilities on their respective campuses and among the members of the current task force who have been working to refine our understanding of how we might think about enrollment as a system concern. The membership of this current task force includes the campus admission directors, the vice chancellors for academic affairs from Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester, and the vice provost and dean of undergraduate education on the Twin Cities campus. I've asked Barbara Kine, the, the vice chancellor from Crookston, and Bob McMaster, the vice provost from Twin Cities, to join me in this update. So the system plan, and I'm just going to be making some brief introductory remarks. The system enrollment plan that this task force is developing considers undergraduate enrollment at the university at the system level. It avoids granular detail best left to the campus plans. Um, and I might mention in connection with that that the enrollment goals at the Twin Cities campus, which, with, which I work on with the deans, um, um, whether, how many people we admit to, to the College of Science and Engineering versus the number admitted to the College of Biological Sciences and so on, um, are, are set as enrollment goals every year. Um, and I give that example because, uh, partly because I am directly involved, as I'm sure the chancellors and vice chancellors are at their respective campuses. Careful, attentive review and planning for each college is done here with Vice Provost McMaster, the college deans and the associate deans and the director of, co of um, campus admissions. So that goes on all the time. What we're talking about here is a system coordination. The, the work you're going to be reviewing today involves identifying the key factors shaping uh, our, en our enrollment environment as a system. It proffers a sketch of system enrollment targets in the context of the local, regional, national, and international education and demographic environment. 
and our specific campus capacities and then identifies strategies that are appropriate to that context and to our, uh, the University of Minnesota. So Barbara and Bob will give you an indication today of what's planned for inclusion in each of these areas when the system enrollment plan is final in early fall. Uh, many of the themes found in this plan are also among the concepts and actions identified in our system um, strategic planning work in the teaching and learning area. In fact, this system enrollment planning work is best understood as one of the sub-areas of the teaching and learning portion of the system plan. In any case, we've been diligent about ensuring that these planning conversations are evolving in ways that complement each other. The system enrollment plan is not going to be a list of recommendations for future consideration or a plan for future planning. It is um, rather, uh, in, in, it's going to be included in the final version of the system-wide strategic plan, and this is the plan, with targets that reflect the goals that this board has identified in the university's progress card and elsewhere, and actions that the planning group has identified to reach those goals. The plan will be ready this fall, but in, uh, in its final form, it will also be an iterative plan. Built into the plan is an expectation of annual reviews um, that also set targets that stretch five to six years out. This will also align uh, the shape of the things we do with uh, capital planning and legislative planning, where we plan ahead, go staying ahead uh, and reviewing what we've just done. Progress will be reviewed each year. Goals can be carefully reset each year as appropriate. So this enrollment group will, will change from a short-term or temporary strategic planning task force to a permanent and ongoing enrollment council with ownership of and responsibility for the execution of the plan and the development of appropriate strategic responses to a changing uh, environment for enrollment. This council will develop and evaluate a rolling six-year target and may generate new iterations of the plan as changes occur in our markets or in the landscape of higher education. The Enrollment Council will continue to be convened by me or my office through regular video meetings and occasional day-long retreats as we've had this past year. So I'm eager to let Bob and Barbara elaborate on the details and to hear your discussion. Um, it, we'll begin with Vice Chancellor Kynieth. I, I do want to note that Barbara is, is retiring and I want to thank her publicly for her service to the Crookston campus and the University of Minnesota, not just here, but, but in everything she's, she's done and to say what a pleasure and privilege it has been to work with her. And there'll be more on that later, I'm sure. Barbara. I will immediately echo uh, those comments to the Vice Chancellor for um, your work uh, that's attributed not just to Crookston, but to the entire system uh, as a whole. So uh, we look forward to the presentation today as well and you going out with the drop the mic. No <laughs> Thank you both for, for your kind comments. Um, Chair Amari, committee members, President Kaler, as Provost Hansen has indicated, the system-wide enrollment management task force has developed a, six, a draft six-year enrollment management plan for undergraduate enrollment and recruitment, excuse me, and initial enrollment modeled after the six-year cycle that we use for the university's capital planning projects, our expectation is that we will update this plan once it's ready and underway. We'll update it on a regular basis so that it always remains a six-year plan. Working on this plan has been, and I will say somewhat surprisingly, fun, energizing, and positive. Members of the task force have worked well together as campus and as system representatives. In my experience at the University of Minnesota, it's the best example of how campuses have worked together in any area. We've had healthy differences of opinion, but we are headed in the same direction. We are eager to continue the work and be held accountable as a permanent council under the oversight of Provost Hansen. The draft plan, and we're not giving you the draft plan today, we're giving you an update on the draft plan. The draft plan on which we are updating you today includes three main sections. Um, we have to figure out who's advancing slides up here, I think. Um, we didn't practice this part. Um, the, the draft plan on which we are updating you today includes three main sections. Factors that shape our environment, 
system and campus targets and goals and some profile descriptions for our campus enrollment. Strategies that emerge given our understanding of the environment and our goals. Within each of the strategies, the plan will identify specific and tangible actions. The focus has been squarely on undergraduate recruitment and initial enrollment. Retention, a crucial element in system enrollment management, is on the docket and will be the focus for the coming year. Today, we'll provide a high-level overview of the factors we find most relevant as they establish the context for enrollment management work. We will articulate enrollment management goals and targets, describe seven strategies, and for each of the strategies, we'll give you a few examples of the action plans that we think will help us achieve our goals. Today's discussion is intentionally high level, 30,000 foot level, and system focused. It avoids granular detail best left to the campus plans. The system enrollment plan is still a work in progress. When ready, it will include a, more, a fairly detailed appendix with a summary of each campus's enrollment plan with specific targets and profile descriptions. Among the factors that affect um, enrollment in higher education, we have identified six as being uh, most crucial to us at this time. While many factors do affect our enrollment through consultation and careful analysis, we have selected these six. We need to understand these factors so we can adapt our strategies for recruitment, retention, and ultimately teaching and learning in light of them. We have no control over some of the factors. The high school graduates are gonna graduate next spring, were born 17 years ago. We have no control over them. But we do have some control, at least, over others. And we also recognize that around the region and around the country, that while we are working hard at understanding the factors that affect our enrollment and working hard to compete effectively, every other college and university is also trying to understand the factors affecting enrollment and compete more effectively against us. We are not working in a vacuum. In future cycles of the plan, our management, the Enrollment Management Council may recognize the need to change or expand the list of impactful factors as we monitor our environment and measure the success of our enrollment strategies and actions. For now, we have selected six factors we will share briefly with you today, along with a few examples of each factor. Out of respect for the committee's governance role and your time today, we will not share all the data or get into deep, detailed discussions about the factors. I'll start with uh, factor one, Regent Omari, Chair Omari, members of the committee. Uh, this involves shifting geodemographics. We're spending a bit of time with the primary factors that affect enrollment management system-wide. These then will inform our later strategies that we're going to discuss in just a few moments. The geodemographics of the nation and the upper middle west are changing quickly as our data will show. These changing and shifting geodemographics will require constant adjustments to our enrollment planning and potential allocation of resources. For example, in the allocation of regional recruiters. We'll start with a map. This choropleth map of the United States illustrates these projected changes over the next five years. Even though Sunbelt states that over the past few decades have experienced rapid growth, such as California and Florida, will start to slow that growth. The most significant increases that you see here uh, occur in low population states, the Dakotas and Wyoming, where despite the high percentage increase, you're not gonna see much impact. Uh, much of the upper middle west, in particular the Ohio, Michigan, Illinois core and New England region will experience significant declines in high school graduates over this period. Although Minnesota um, positively shows modest growth through 2023, uh, the models, the longer term models that we're looking at show a decline in our high school population after that. So this growth is really not going to continue over the long haul. 
Uh, one spe specific example of the enrollment problem for the U of M Twin Cities uh, is that we recruit heavily in Illinois. That's our third um, largest state that we recruit from, in particular, particularly Chicago. Illinois' high school population is expected to decline. That could shift our, our models. Also note a very, only a very slight increase expected in Wisconsin, which is our largest reciprocity state. This series of graphs depicts a topic we have been discussing for many years and it's critical to this conversation. Of the expected growth in Minnesota out to 2035, two thirds of the increase is expected in the student of color population. Our recruitment and retention efforts for students of color will need to intensify. The resolution on undergraduate diversity adopted by the board in February is a very good start in maintaining our commitment to SOC recruitment and student success. This is a place where the U of M needs stronger partnerships with the K-12 system that we've discussed before <coughs> to ensure college readiness for admission to our campuses. Otherwise, we will need to enhance funding as students likely arrive less prepared. Factor two involves intense recruitment, the intense recruitment environment. As we've discussed before, there's an out-migration of students from the state of Minnesota each year. Aside from the regional picture illustrated on this map, where we lose many more students to our neighboring states than we gain, as you can see from the data, Minnesota is also a national target with many regional recruiters here in the Twin Cities from other campuses. We get our pockets picked every year from states and universities <laughs> across the nation. Regionally, we are also a high population state, regionally, approximately 5.5 million people, unlike many of our neighboring states that gives us a larger student population to pick from. <laughs> In many ways, we're a victim of our own success. We are known for high quality education and universities know it around the country. So one of our goals is to start to reverse this out-migration. To drill down just a bit more, this map depicts the in-migration, out-migration patterns for the upper Middle West flagship campuses. North Dakota itself, the two flagship universities there, enroll over 2,000 freshmen from Minnesota each year. Iowa enrolls almost 1,000 Minnesota students. Note that even with Wisconsin, uh, the UMTC enrolled 765 Badgers in fall 2016, and Wisconsin enrolled uh, about 100 less, 644 Minnesota freshmen. Interestingly, this imbalance is actually better than it used to be. Oh, okay, sorry. Factor three. The cost of higher education is only one factor in college choice, but it's an important one, as your budget discussions have reflected. Factor three is about reality and perception of those costs. The reality is that other institutions do have financial strategies that specifically target Minnesota high school students. For example, in 2013, the University of Iowa began offering um, grants of up to nearly $10,000 to out-of-state residents, read Minnesota students, to out-of-state residents to address the disparity between resident and non-resident rates. Many institutions also have lower tuition rates that appeal to Minnesota students and their families. Reciprocity allows the University of North Dakota to charge Minnesota residents $398 per credit, only $36 more than it charges North Dakota residents. At NDSU, Minnesota residents will pay an annual base tuition of $8,850 in the coming academic year, only $950 more than they charge Minnesota residents. Even so, NDSU's annual tuition for Minnesota residents will be about $1,400 less than Crookston's banded yearly tuition of $10,282. And Crookston has the lowest tuition in the university system. Perception is also reality. 
Seasoned observers understand that sticker price and net price are different. The difference is hard to explain, however, especially to those newer to the higher education environment, first generation, lower income, communities that have traditionally been underserved by higher education. Private college discounting tactics are effective. A $20,000 discount slash scholarship at a private college sounds better than a $5,000 scholarship to the University of Minnesota. Your net price will still likely be higher at the private institution, but the scholarship is the simple point that sounds like a good deal. The net cost story on this slide is a good story, comparing University of Minnesota net costs, the brightly colored lines, to net costs at competitor institutions, the grade outlines, University of Minnesota students experience lower net cost across the family income levels. But net cost is not a simple story and we need to find better ways to communicate it. The net cost story shown here is also a good story. We are using our Title IV financial aid appropriately. Students whose family income is lower pay a lower net price. The University of Minnesota has a good story to tell about debt burden for undergraduate education. 39% of our baccalaureate graduates have no debt upon graduation. The amount of debt for those who do have debt has been going down each year for the last five years across the system. This message, however, can get lost in the midst of the immediate attention to college debt overall. The takeaway is that we need to communicate more effectively about net costs and debt. Factor four, attending to the workforce needs and employer expectations as a product of and a longtime advocate for public higher education, I take it as an article of faith that higher education is a public good. Communities and states benefit when their citizens are well and broadly educated. Society benefits. In recent decades, however, public discourse about higher education has shifted to focus more on the economic factors, and they are important. The state's economy benefits when skilled and talented workers are available to fill current and future jobs. Employers look to colleges and universities to provide talented employees. Families invest in higher education so their children can get jobs that allow them to live well. Employers specifically are looking for graduates who have learned a content area and have critical core competencies such as critical thinking and integrity and work ethic and crucial skills such as leadership and intercultural competency. With rapid changes in science and technology, workforce demographics and in work itself, employers need employees who have the depth and breadth that characterize graduates of four-year institutions. We need to pay attention to what those needs are. Data do show that hourly wages rise for each additional level of income of education completed. And while recently published research is beginning to indicate that the boost that you gain as a student from your four-year degree might depend in part on the family income level that you start with, the generally accepted statement is that a bachelor's degree holder makes about a million dollars more over a lifetime than a high school graduate. Clearly there is an individual benefit to earning a four-year degree. Factor six, five, excuse me, factor five is about the value proposition and brand recognition of the University of Minnesota. This is about what makes us special as the University of Minnesota and what makes a University of Minnesota degree more valuable within the state and beyond. Working closely with our colleagues in university relations, we think we can tell our story better than we do currently. Our land grant mission, puts teaching, research, and outreach together in the classroom in real time with real impact. We provide rigorous education, demand excellence, and transform students' lives. Our five campuses have distinctive strengths and cultures so students can find their best fit. 
Rochester's special focus on health science and its connections to the Mayo Clinic attracts students whose life experiences have made them passionate about health careers. The Duluth campus attracts students seeking the richness of its comprehensive range of undergraduate programs, select graduate and professional programs, growing research agenda, and its beautiful location in the state of Minnesota. The Morris campus's commitment to a robust liberal arts education brings students equally passionate about broad-based education, sustainability, and civic engagement. Students come to Crookston for the small campus, big degree feel, experiential teaching and learning, and unique niche academic programs. The Twin Cities flagship campus with its top 10 R1 research status and Big Ten membership brings students and visibility and prestige that benefit all of the campuses. Factor six is the recognition that historically we've done a good job of enrollment management campus by campus. We've also competed with each other for students. We have not taken in the past an opportunity to behave as a system and we are now doing that. As I said at the outset, work on the strategic enrollment management plan has changed that and it has been a very positive experience to develop a new way of thinking that is reflected in the draft system plan. Before moving on to the strategies and actions, we wanted to provide our current thinking on specific campus, campus enrollment goals, kind of a first stab at this. Uh, you can see our system-wide goal is to increase enrollments by 3,000 students over this period. Of course, our plan is to, uh, of these, our plan is to enroll 2,000 more Minnesota residents. These decisions were based on estimates of the possible capacity and constraints <coughs> on each one of the campuses. As you can see, the specific targets reaching out to 2014 include 2,600 at Crookston, uh, 9,900 at Duluth, 1,800 at Morris, 800 at Rochester, and between 32,500 to 33,000 on the Twin Cities campus. This would bring the total system undergraduate enrollment to 47,600 uh, representing, including the 3,000 increase. These targets, of course, will be reviewed and adjusted every two years, as mentioned, part of a rolling plan. <coughs> Of course, each campus is presenting or has presented specific campus plans to the Board of Regents already. Three plans were presented this year, Morris, Twin Cities, and Crookston, and Rochester and Duluth are scheduled to present next year. Based on the targets, as well as other, as well as other factors we analyzed, each campus has provided more specificity around geography, Pell status, first generation, and international goals as represented on this slide. The table provides data for what we call NHS, new high school students, freshmen, and NAS, new advanced standing students, transfers, and then the total enrollment. Also note the meta goals we provided on the right hand side. Additional considerations include the academic profile of each institution, students of color uh, targets, access to online education that Provost Hansen will discuss tomorrow morning, uh, and retention and graduation. Ongoing collaboration will be very important as targets and broad goals are adjusted. We'll now shift the conversation to the seven strategies and actions we, we designed, where again, Provost Hansen will provide some additional thoughts tomorrow morning in her presentation. The system, and, the system strategic enrollment plan will include further explanations of the strategies and articulation of the specific actions that you'll, you'll receive uh, in, in a month or two. Again, strategies for this phase focus on recruitment and admission. In the next phase, the System Council will start to turn their attention to retention, graduation, and student success. Strategy number one involves an analysis of the out-migration issue discussed earlier. For example, using the National Steering Clearinghouse data, we are looking at details on where our students matriculate if they do not enroll at the University of Minnesota. Certain patterns emerge, such as greater Minnesota students migration to the Dakotas and Iowa State. Interestingly, St. Thomas is also a major competitor for us, given the information we, we heard earlier. Strategy number two involves a more integrative approach to system-wide admissions. 
Our goal here is to retain students in the system who are not admitted to the campus of first choice. We must make certain that our application language and possible decline letter detail information about other system campus options, importance of fit within the system, and benefits of a U of M brand. We must remind students that there is one University of Minnesota diploma, not five. We need, to continue, uh, we, we need to continue nurturing Share My App as a reminder uh, for students who apply to the Twin Cities campus. Uh, a letter is forwarded asking whether they wish to be considered at, at other campuses, and if so, their application is forwarded and processed. We already shared deny lists earlier in the system, across the system than we used to, and we're also looking at releasing the wait lists on the campuses sooner. We've identified four components to strategy three. One is to grow partnerships with Minnesota high schools. The K-12 partnership is particularly important to enhance student of color uh, retention and access. Number two is to identify new undergraduate to professional program pathways within our system, both professional and graduate. Uh, a good example here is the success with the Crookston to Twin Cities Veterinary Medicine Pathway. Students complete their degree uh, at, at Crookston and if they achieve a certain grade level are automatically admitted to the Vet Science Program. Number three, where appropriate, increase Minnesota State two-year to four-year collaborations. Uh, there are a few examples of this that we could write as well. Uh, keeping in mind that Minnesota State uh, is working very hard now to keep their two-year students within their four-year system as well. The fourth component in involves diversity. Often, underrepresented minorities are less likely to leave the state and enhances our diversity to keep these students within the system. For example, we should work very hard to keep the Morris Native American students in our system for graduate school where possible. Strategy number number I must have four. Four, yeah. Strategy number four focuses on financial aid and affordability. Just last year, we created the Land Grant Legacy Program to increase the number of Greater Minnesota students and CFANS. Our plans are to expand this in programs such as the President's Emerging Scholars system-wide. In the capital campaign, President Kaler has established a, prior, a priority for student support and a goal of $1 billion for undergraduate, graduate, and professional support. This would provide much needed scholarship dollars to enable us to compete better. Uh, the U of M undergraduate case statement as part of that plan prioritizes a Minnesota first set of priorities for enhancing student support. There is also a need to enhance our messaging about affordability and the University of Minnesota as a low cost option. And we noted that from the net price graphs that you saw previously. Strategy five is to develop and brand and market the system's online learning opportunities. Current efforts to develop and brand online learning are largely campus-based or college-based. As part of the university's intention to articulate a system strategy for online learning, we must also develop a brand identity, and it needs to be distinct from the long-held brand identity of Minsku, Minnesota State, called Minnesota Online. We also need to develop a one-stop portal for online programs and courses to ensure that prospective students can find our online programs and current students can explore options for courses online at other University of Minnesota campuses. The target population of working adult students seeking to upgrade their credentials and skills is not unlimited, but it is very large. Prospective online students are just one example of a market segment to which we need to better target our marketing. In the online learning marketplace, Kirkson's reputation for academic quality and excellent student support in online programs should be helpful to the system's efforts. And with effective marketing and the University of Minnesota name behind all of our programs, we should be able to compete in selected niche program areas, even though as a system, we are relatively late entrance to online education market. Strategy six 
As Provost Hansen indicated at the outset, the task force will become a permanent enrollment council comprised of vice chancellors, the vice provost for undergraduate education, and directors of admissions. The council will continue the strategic work that has begun. Formalizing responsibilities for system-wide admissions functions, for example, technology support, and funding the offices charged with those responsibilities will be important. Directors of admission will continue to meet and work together at the operational level. As part of their work, they have already begun to explore options for common applications and shared platforms. Their increased collaboration and communication have already produced concrete changes in outreach to Minnesota high school counselors and at the Crookston campus, re-recruitment of students denied admission to the Twin Cities and Duluth campuses. Finally, Strategy 7 emphasizes the importance of building a common University of Minnesota brand, uh, a specific comment, yet maintain the uniqueness on each of our campuses. In part, this involves making sure the public understands both the value of a college degree, but also specifically the excellence of a U of M degree. We continue to tell our students, our prospective students, that they will get a world-class education, learning from world-class faculty and world-class facilities at all of our institutions. As a system, we promote what is called a T-shaped breadth and depth undergraduate curriculum. This includes liberal general education coursework at one level, providing the breadth with the, with the expectation that students will also intensively focus in one area, providing depth. In fact, a few years ago, I attended a, a conference sponsored by IBM on the importance of the T-shaped uh, curriculum for success in industry, and the private sector has, has viewed this as very important for their hiring. As a system, we also promote the importance of high-impact educational practices, such as study abroad and undergraduate research. Moving forward, it is also essential that we work closely with university relations for improving branding, of our system, public relations and marketing and messaging around the system. These conversations have already started. And here you see the seven strategies together. To summarize, the enrollment management plan is part and parcel of the system strategic planning process. The enrollment management plan is envisioned as a six-year plan with systematic updates on a two-year rolling basis with ownership and accountability assigned to an ongoing council. The plan is still a draft plan that focuses on recruitment and initial enrollment. Over the next few months, we will continue to refine and advance the strategies and action plans. Next year, the council will expand its focus to retention. This concludes our presentation. We would now enjoy engaging in a conversation with you about the draft plan with particular interest in your thoughts about the seven strategies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, before I open it up, I just want to underscore the point that uh, the Vice Chancellor just made about the seven strategies that we see in front of us. We want to focus from a governance level around these seven strategies and how we as a board can engage with these strategies, thoughts and ideas that we have about them or particular questions about them, less about how they got to the strategies but focused on the seven. So uh, Regent Powell and then Regent Beeson after that. Thank Please, you, Regent Powell. Thanks, thanks, Chair Amari, and, and, uh, and thank you um, to the presenters. I think this is a really good plan, and I, th I think the way that you've framed it up, it, it feels very strategic to me and hitting on the right elements, and so um, I, I think it really provides good, good direction. Um, so I have a couple of, you know, kind of observation slash questions, that, and the first one is really a reflection for for us as the board, I think that the the target that we set for enrollment increase is is a really key question, and um, the proposal is that it goes up by three thousand, right over the over the next over the next several years. And I don't propose we do it today, but it, this might be something that we want to look at a little more deeply. I think the three the constraints are you know what where's where where do we have capacity to absorb. Mm -hmm. And, and that's maybe is the right answer, but it might be worth looking at what it would take to go to go higher than 3,000, and, and in particular, just knowing nothing. But um, Morris at 1,800, it just seems subscale. 
and it's such a great proposition and if you could do more there you would a thousand in the Twin Cities over a five-year period seems really low and and so there's I my suggestion would be that we come back and and have a little more detailed discussion of what that target is because it's really crucial and it defines a lot of what we do the other um, comment you know has to do with uh, and stems from uh, Provost Hansen's uh, narrative remark where she talks about the intense recruiting environment, which I think is true, and you've referenced it several times now, and I fully accept. I mean, we could, we're bleeding, um, you know, our kids to other states, so it's very competitive, and I accept that. Um, the question I have is, given the marketing, the pool of marketing funds, I don't know which bucket things come out of. For me, marketing is marketing, and you know, we, you, you can shift it around if you need to. And so the question is, would we be, I mean, can we use more resources here so that we can come out fighting here and really do, and, and, you know, and execute these strategies as strongly as we can? I mean, it's possible that we'd be better off spending money more highly targeted in this way than on uh, our broadcast initiative, which I don't expect you to answer that, but I think it just raises the question of whether we can move resources around a little bit and we get more um, out of that million and a half, as an example, if we were to put a lot of it here um, with, and, you know, to really energize these efforts. So those are my observations. I, I think it's really, you've laid out a good direction. Thank you. And, and before I turn to the Vice Provost, I think you make a good point around that 3,000 uh, number of increase, recognizing that that's our direction. We directed the 3,000, and, and, and I think as we move forward in that conversation, it's an um, uh, engagement opportunity for you all to tell us, well, here's where we have capacity, here's how many new faculty we'd have to hire if we go that direction, here's what X co will cost, and then have that conversation as a, as a board and administration. Uh, so I'll turn to uh, Vice Provost McMaster. Yeah, uh, Chair Omari and, and Regent Powell, I just wanted to comment on uh, a few points you made. One is, I realize that 1,000 increase looks rather slim from the Twin Cities. That actually is part of a plan that was started about three years ago to increase the undergraduate enrollment from 30,000 to 33,000. So that is, is on the path to get to 33,000, at which point we can revisit that target. Uh, certainly there are strategic areas where we would like to increase our enrollment on the Twin Cities campus, and I think we've had some of those conversations before. One certainly is science and engineering where we enroll about 1,150 uh, freshmen each year. Uh, we're having a series of meetings, conversations with the deans in CSC now to see <coughs> what we would need to do to increase that to 1,250 or 1,350 or 1,450. Uh, right now, we certainly could not do that and maintain the quality of the education in that college. A big piece of that certainly would be around chemistry and additional access into chemistry. We're going to see some of that with the next presentation. Uh, in terms of marketing, there's no doubt that additional resources would assist us in, in attracting more students. Um, there are a whole series of national fairs, and we've started to play pretty well together in, in system-wide recruitment, but additional resources would do no harm and probably add a lot to our capabilities. Please. If I could add, um, Chair Omari, Regent Powell, what I would add to that is from a, call, a small campus perspective, we, we've had some interesting conversations in the task force about what does optimize enrollment mean? And uh, so I can give you a perspective from the Crookston campus in that we have, we have some residence hall beds that are empty and we have some seats in some classes in some programs that are not filled. We can, um, we can grow our enrollment within current resources in those kinds of situations. There are other programs on the, on the Crookston campus where if we grew, we'd need new science labs. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of constraints become very expensive for us. I think some of our, to the marketing issue, I think some of our marketing really needs to be done. Um, we, we've talked a lot about um, what it means to have a University of Minnesota degree and trying to distinguish the education that we provide from other providers' education. Um, and we think that that's the kind of thing that could be marketed institution-wide. We also know that we could use a landing page for admissions 
that could speak to all of our campuses. And then we also need to be very direct and targeted in our marketing for different kinds of populations. The online learning market is a completely different student population than the traditional. So it's, I think it's a mix of all of the above that will be necessary. And probably that will require some shifting of uh, priorities and funds. Thank you. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, presenters. This has been a, been a, a really a good presentation. I would echo Regent Paul's comments about the, the, um, um, the strategies and some of the tactics you've outlined and focus on marketing. I would take a more radical approach to pricing. I think we need to be really realistic about um, uh, our Western Minnesota campuses. It doesn't really work having to pay $1,700 more at Crookston than it does at NDSU. And if we have capacity, and I heard you say that we do at Crookston, I'm just using that as an example. If we have capacity of rooms uh, and we were to lower, if we were to, I'm just talking out loud, but if we were lower tuition there to go below North Dakota State and we attracted 50 students as a result, we would back the napkin. Um, <laughs> kind of math, that's about a half a million dollars in new revenue, plus the re the room revenue that we would be accruing. We'd lose some money off of the decrease of 1700 per student, but there's a break even where, because I, I, I don't, I, it, I think it's gonna be hard to reach these enrollment goals. Then on the flip side, I would be more radical with the tuition here on the Twin Cities and within these colleges that are, that where the pricing so, Elastic, we it feels like we just need to break this apart and uh, grow some areas and be ready to take a tuition increase and others more radically drop because I, I don't know how Western Minnesota with the demographics and with the Dakotas being as aggressive as they are I I think it's gonna be hard to hit those numbers. Any comments? Omar, you don't have Re to. Regent Beeson. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. It is very challenging to do that. Um, we have a, again the the net price and the sticker price conversation is difficult. But competing of North Dakota, NDSU in particular, is a competitor for almost all of us, um, and we're behind their game now. They've taken a lead in that game. So we would have some catch up to do and we would have to do something different in order to accomplish that. Thank you, uh, Regent Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, presenters. Uh, reference uh, factor to the map, if you will, where it shows the migration and out migration of students to, uh, to Minnesota, if you would, please. You just pat there. Uh, Let's look at uh, South Dakota, 274 students coming to Minnesota, 961 going into South Dakota. Question, are those numbers where they're academically qualified? In other words, the 961, would they have qualified academically to be admitted to Minnesota? Uh, Chair, Vice Provost uh, McMaster. Yeah, yeah, uh, Chair Omari and, and Regent Johnson, uh, some would have and some wouldn't have, and it would depend on the campus because uh, the academic standards do vary campus by campus. So certainly some of those perhaps, I'm going to make up a number, 30% uh, would have been admissible to one of our campuses um, if, if, the, if the fiscal underpinnings had been correct. Uh, Mr. Chairman, second observation. This has to do with recruiting. Um, working with young people as I do in the House of the Lord, they come back for vacations and see family and friends. And uh, when they walk into my office and I see they have a Wisconsin Badger sweatshirt on or an Iowa Hawkeye, I think I have failed and it just irritates me. And I know they are qualified to have attended the University of, of Minnesota. So we begin to have some conversations. I lay this Lutheran guilt on them, the whole nine yards, but I don't get anywhere. But it's interesting. Last Thursday, standing on the first tee box at Wilmer, 
playing with a father, he turned to me and he said, my son really wanted to go to the University of Minnesota. My other two children did. He said, my son's going to South Dakota. And I didn't know what to say other than say, tell me about it. He said, our recruiting visit was not very good. They really didn't want my son and he was equally qualified academically. In fact, he was all state in wrestling and all, but it just kind of ruined my day for a while, thinking that, are we missing something in the recruiting process? I know it's not perfect any place and it could have been a bad day for the recruiter and all, I, I understand that. But I, the point is, recruiting and those campus visits are extremely, extremely important. From driving on to the campus, like Regent Ameris, Tom Devine and I used to talk about, once you drive down University Avenue, are the lawns mowed? Is Fraternity and Sorority Road uh, cleaned up? Are the sidewalks repaired? And they haven't even seen any, talked to any people yet. And that importance of that glance of, here's my first impression of, of this campus. So there are things we can improve on. Again, I'm not being judgmental or punitive, but I uh, make an observation because I hate seeing those other colors come into my office from <laughs> Iowa and Wisconsin and NDSU and all that. You know the story. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Regent Johnson, having been to South Dakota, I can tell you that our campus looks much better than theirs does. <laughs> Please, Vice, Vice uh, Chancellor. Chair Amari, Regent Johnson, I can tell you from a parent's perspective the opposite version of that story. Uh, my son clearly was not wanted at UW-Madison. We went for our campus trip and uh, we made a trip to the Duluth campus of the wonderful University of Minnesota where he was treated um, extraordinarily well and he knew immediately that that was where he was going to be going and he and his wife were both proud graduates and proud bulldogs. We pay a lot of attention on all of our campuses to the way we treat our guests and our prospective students as they come to us. Um, unfortunately, we don't, the, the fit isn't going to be right for every student on every campus. We do our very best to help them understand fit, even when that sometimes means there might be a different campus in the University of Minnesota that's a better one for you. Um, we, under, we do understand then the importance and we are equally frustrated and dismayed when we see those other colored jerseys around town. Mr. Chairman, may I follow up briefly? Very briefly. If I were in the recruiting business of colleges and universities and I had a, these were on our staff, I would ask these folks, say, who, who's coming to visit to campus next week? And I'd want you to call them ahead of time that student or their parents, because I'd want to find out what matters to them. What are you looking for in academics and social life and what's, what's really important? I'd want to know so that it's not just carte blanche because everybody is different. They're looking for something different. But if you know you got some very good students coming in, I would make that phone call and visit with them and sell the program. <laughs> As, as, as we, we, we move down the list, I'll tell you that having worked in admissions many, 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 many years ago, uh, and shout out to my admissions folks in the room here, they do have student profiles and they know how to direct them to the types of things that they're looking for. Recognizing that if we are going to make a phone call every time, uh, our president at the end of the table is going to have to adjust the budget uh, so that we can have more time for folks to be calling every student that we have come visit. Um, so we've got a, a nice list of folks that want to comment, so we'll go to Regent Shu next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, appreciate the presentation uh, and the information. I, I agree with uh, what has been said previously. Uh, I think there's, there are some opportunities that have been missed um, so far, uh, but this is a draft, so that's okay. Um, I would say that, you know, when looking at a map like this, it's hard to understand exactly what we're looking at because it's iPads data and it's, you know, everybody in the state. And, you know, if you go to the next page, um, I think the, the question is, you know, how many of our um, admitted students are actually going to these places? And I don't know how uh, we would find that out. I think we generally try to get them to tell us where they're going if they're not coming here. But I've never seen any statistics or any data on that. So that's one thing 
that I think uh, we should look at if we haven't already. Um, the the uh, two words that I was waiting for are test optional, and I didn't hear them. And I should have brought it up this morning when we were talking about the law school because I remembered last year that Harvard Law School decided that they were going test optional on the LSAT, which is something that um, I think our law school should consider. But now we're talking about undergraduates. I think going test optional is ex an extremely important uh, strategy for some of our other campuses and possibly some of you know possibly the Twin Cities. Um, because I think there, you know, there are a lot of schools that have already gone this route, and I think most of the uh, data on it has been positive. So I think we should uh, we should look at it. Obviously, we've got empty seats. We know that we've got empty seats on the Twin Cities. So it's it's hard to look at a map like this and say, hey, you know, it would be one thing if we didn't have any empty seats, but we do. And the optimal size project in Rochester, I'm interested in what's happening down there and maybe on the other system campuses as well. But we know on this campus that we have um, the possibility of enrolling more students. And I think we can do that with um, um, you know, things like test optional. The other thing is if, if we were really strapped for students, you know, there are ways we can, uh, we could have an automatic admissions standard, for example, if you get a 4.0. Let's just say 4.0 because we <laughs> we don't want to open it too much. But let's say there's a four. If you have a 4.0 in your college, in your high school in the state of Minnesota, you're automatically admitted to the university, and that's something that a student can consider. And that's free marketing because once we come out with a plan like that, everyone on the planet, or at least in the in the state, will know about it. And that's better than billboards around uh, the interstates here for NDSU and UND and, and those types of places. So I think there there's some other things we can do and if we were really um, going to uh, you know have to pull out the stops to try and attract students, we will always get the best students in the state who want to be here. Um, we just have to make sure uh, we let them know that we have a place for them. Now. Uh, it was great news to hear that CESE is thinking about increasing its size because I think it can increase. It probably should increase. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of things like chemistry and you know those types of things that have to be addressed in order to get there. Um, but also, I think uh, from an engineering perspective, you know there are plenty of jobs in the state I think that are going to be looking for those types of graduates and there's also probably an opportunity to have differential equation or not differential equation tuition. differential tuition um, yeah I'm going back to math now um, <laughs> difficult equations um, I think we can uh, I think we could probably enroll more students and I think we could probably maintain uh, a high employment uh, uh, percentage after graduation. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is the best marketing we have is our athletics programs. Uh, UMD should get a nice bump this next year because of the national championship in hockey. So, Len, I'm waiting for those uh, those numbers to come in. Thank you, Regent Shu. Uh, any, any, please, Vice Provost. Yes, um, uh, Chair Omari and Regent Shu, just one comment. I'll, I'll leave test optional and um, 4.0 GPAs alone for today. But uh, we, we are, in fact, looking at the clearinghouse data, and in the final report, there will be detailed information on where students go when they're admitted here and don't come here. Uh, so you, and you'll see that broken down by race and ethnicity and geography and by college. So there'll be a very rich data source in that. Uh, the other comment is sometimes it's okay if students don't come here. If they've decided they, they want to get 100 miles away from home, from their parents or uh, their families, and it's a good experience, that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with some students going to Madison if it's a good fit, and um, they're going to have a good experience there. And if, in fact, if they don't go to Madison, they're going to go to Harvard or Penn State or Berkeley. 
Thank you. And, and Regent Shu started to bring us back up to these enrollment strategies, and so I want to refocus the board to be thinking about those enrollment strategies um, as we go through a list. And I have several of you who still want to comment, so next we'll go to uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> and thank you for this this presentation. Um, I know Regent Paul and Regent Beeson both uh, lavished you with praise, and I want mine to be just a little more praise than, than they provided. <laughs> um, that, this, is, this is just a wonderful conversation, and I appreciate the, the, the chair of the committee and the chair of, and of the board for, for uh, giving us this opportunity and, and for you developing what I think is a wonderful way of, of being very intentional. Uh, about something that is obviously the essence of what we will be going forward, right? The students that you admit. Um, and the first point that I would, I would make in, in reacting to what's on here, I, you know, I, I struggle a little bit because I, I, I see the University of Minnesota very much as part of, uh, of a higher ed um, sort of system within, uh, around the state. You know, we got, we've got the University of Minnesota, you've got Minnesota State Colleges, you've got the privates. Um, all of, uh, and, and, and there's a concern that sometimes when, you know, the university gets a cold, the other systems sneeze because of the, the just the, the sheer size of, of, of the university and the demand for the university. And so when we talk about increasing enrollment, it's not happening in a vacuum. That's going to have an impact on other state colleges and universities around the state. Uh, but at the same time, I'm, I'm also an unrepentant supporter of what we provide, um, in, that, in that if there is a demand for what we're providing, I think we're as, uh, you know, the best at doing what we do. And therefore, um, if it makes sense for us to be able to move forward in, in that respect, I, I'm inclined to say we do go forward. Um, there is a, I do have a bit of a concern that we also do compete with ourselves, and you know we're, we're seeing this issue, um, I think in, in, in part at, uh, at Duluth, where um, there's quite a bit of migration from UMD after a year or two to the Twin Cities campus. Um, I, I think that that certainly leads us to have a, 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 a conversation about the cost differential. When the cost differential is pretty modest, you're going to see more of that. Obviously, if there was a bigger uh, um, difference in, in UMD. Is, is permitted to be in a position to compete with other regionals, um, I think that that helps us with that issue as well. Um, not only is it a function of just overall enrollment capacity and, you know, and, and filling that capacity at UMD, uh, but it's challenging to have your student body turning over in, in, a, in a significant percentage, that you want people that are there for four years and, and, and complete their degrees. So uh, I, I want to look at that. We talked about the... Um, uh, well, go, talking about the, the slide that Regent Johnson brought up, you know, I, I, I want to be real careful about talking too much about the, you know, the, the, um, yeah, I don't want to, any chicken little concerns about population issues for Minnesota just yet, because even if we were looking at a declining enrollment, when you look at that mass uh, exodus of students, in, of, of whom at least some significant uh, percentage would be quali uh, qualified and successful um, at the uh, university campuses, um, we certainly have the ability to address any issues with population by being more effective at recruiting and retaining the best and brightest who, who currently now are finding a basis to, to leave the state. And, and, I, and when we talk about adding 3,000 additional students, and I saw there was a few, you know, it was, it was in the hundreds for the Twin Cities, and then I think the, the lion's share were the, the system campuses. Um, there is a big difference. The, the Twin Cities campus is the one, I think, that, that where we find the, the largest um, concern of, of people from the state that students can't get access to the Twin Cities campus. We're turning away more Minnesota students from the Twin Cities campus than, than the other campuses in a fairly significant way. And so um, the increase on the Twin Cities campus, I would really want us to have a, a, a focus on increasing the number of Minnesota students that have access to our flagship institution. Um, and you know, I, I don't say that as a matter of xenophobia, but I want to make sure that we're not suffering from xenophilia, where suddenly people from other places are more valuable to, to our, our land-grant university than, than people from Minnesota. Um, and then, you know, finally, um, you know, clearly when you talk about recruiting, um, you know, there's a, there's a reason that, you know, a, a car dealership in, 
in uh, uh, Rochester markets to people that live around Rochester. You know, they're, they're the most likely to buy a car from that dealership. When we're talking about spending recruiting dollars on the best and brightest students, you know, students from Minnesota, as opposed to students perhaps from a southern climate or uh, one of the coastal regions, um, they know this climate. They have friends here. They have contacts here. I think you know, you're, certainly your bang for the buck is better when you're focusing on, on those top students. Um, and as we know from the data, they're far more likely to stay and support our, our uh, marketplace after they graduate. So I do want to keep you know, pushing that point forward. Um, otherwise, uh, this is just a fantastic conversation. It's a wonderful report, and uh, I hope we'll you know, continue to develop it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, Regent Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari. Thank you, presenters. Uh, great presentation. I, I actually looked at it last night, and I was uh, struck by some things. I, I didn't say much today at the, at the budget deal. I was, I was busy running the meeting, but a couple things from this actually come to come to points to me about the budget. I, uh, there's a slide on here where 43% of the Twin Cities graduates have zero debt, and yet it's the highest priced campus, if you will, for uh, uh, tuition. So I find, I find that interesting, you know, that it's 43% of zero debt, the highest, even though it's the highest price. Um, it does point to a good value. Another thing I want to say, living out in western Minnesota, in the western third, those numbers are real. They're real that go to University of North Dakota, North Dakota State, South Dakota State. Part of that, and I visited Worthington not so long ago, and I remember going in I think it was a Dairy Queen, and they were selling Sioux Falls, South Dakota newspapers. Just west of Alexandria, they're selling Fargo-Moorhead newspapers. And so it's not surprising that those families and students are being bombarded by Sioux Falls media, Fargo media, that they get more information sometimes on those schools. And you're not your head, you agree with me, Regent Simonson, than we do in Minnesota. And, um, I don't like that they fly the North Dakota State Bison flag down Alexandria's Main Street on some days, but it's just the way it is about Western Minnesota. Uh, one of the things that I did find out in going through my, oh, what would I call it, my uh, budget thought process, and I was kind of shocked to know these numbers, but I think they're great and it's a way we can market. Parents, you as now and as friends of our, at the legislature have helped us with this, targeting student money to students and families rather than in blocks to institutions, and I'm talking about PSEO and uh, concurrent enrollment. I was virtually shocked to find out that 9,400 Minnesota high school kids receive, and I think it's great, I think it's great as part of our, uh, our land grab mission, 9,400 Minnesota kids got University of Minnesota credits last year. So those are typical people we want to start recruiting. They're already getting, and I think the other thing was about 400 and some students went to their high school senior year on this campus, and about 90% of them then enrolled for the first year of college. So I guess my point in that, I noticed a statistic that in the last few years we've doubled our three-year graduation rate. I'm a parent who benefited from that, one less year of tuition for my own son. Um, I think that is only going to grow. I think that is only going to grow. And I think we have to position ourselves as a university to somehow be in the right position as that does, getting involved with these students out in the hinterlands or whatever. And I, I, uh, I know Vice uh, Provost McMaster has dealt with rural high schools about them wanting more Minnesota credits in their schools. So I appreciate that. But that's my point. I think we really have to, as, as the world turns and we move into the third century, or third uh, decade of the 21st century, I think that the way people pay for tuition and the way we do things is gonna change and we need to position ourselves to that advantage rather than a disadvantage. Thank I don't know if they have anything to say about that. Thank you, Regent Anderson. I'm guessing that bison flag is flying on football Saturdays? It's flying all day long. <laughs> all week long. Uh, pushing for time here, uh, Regent Lucas? Yeah, quickly, thank you, Chair Omari. <clears throat> One statistic that jumped out at me because it, I had a different mindset is that we have somehow flipped the uh, 
the students from Wisconsin. We have now 100 more students from Wisconsin, according to what I wrote down, than they have of ours. And I'm just wondering how you explain that, because I always thought it was the other way around. It's that slide we didn't have in our... Yes, uh, Cheryl yeah. Murray flagship. And, yeah. and Regent Lucas. Uh, we, we do enroll more Wisconsin students than they do Minnesota students. And that's been a long-term trend. Uh, oh, wow. In fact, the difference has been much more significant in the past than it is now. Uh, about a year ago, we actually had even the score almost, and it was about even trade. In fact, we've all often asserted we should just put all the students on the St. Croix Bridge into a prisoner exchange uh, and not let them go in either direction. Because uh, uh, a lot of them come back. They either come back here or go back to Madison. Um, but last year, it tipped a little bit in Wisconsin's favor. Uh, we've always been a little suspicious of the application process there because students are supposed to be treated identical in the reciprocity or with the reciprocity agreements. And we've seen our, or the number of Wisconsin residents uh, fluctuate a lot from 18% of the class to 14 to 17, depending on the quality and the, and the overall pool that year. Year after year, Wisconsin seems to enroll 10% uh, Minnesota residents. Uh, student Representative Dean. Thank you, Chair Omari. I have um, a comment and a question. I'll try and keep them both as brief as I can. Um, first, my comment, I think that uh, one of the most practical things that we can be doing campus to campus is, you know, not only talking about the strengths that each of the five campuses have at, you know, this campus wide level, but just making sure that our tour guides and our recruiters each kind of know the different strengths so that, you know, if, um, someone comes to Crookston and they tour it and they love the U of M feel and they love the degree, but they say, wow, this town is just too small for me. I don't think that I can do it. We make sure that their tour guide kind of tunes into that, you know, says, wow, you know, I understand that, you know, we have Duluth, we have the Twin Cities, maybe help them get a tour set up rather than just letting them walk out the front door, wander down Highway 2 and bump into UND and end up there. Um, you know, the same way goes down here. I toured the Twin Cities and it wasn't quite for me. I toured Morris, it really wasn't for me. And I'd actually gotten all the way committed to Iowa before I even found out Crookston existed and applied really quick and changed my decision to go there because I finally found a campus that really fit me. So just um, working on the campus specific level just with the people who are actually there and interacting with the students could be really helpful. Then just a little bit more technical question about um, Talking about the uh, diversity um, recruitment levels, are you planning on looking at diverse, diversity within the state, diversity outside of the state, or just kind of drawing from each as we've done in the past? Vice Chair Amari, Representative Dean, as we've worked on the enrollment plan, what we're talking about is uh, wanting the diversity of our student population to mirror the diversity of the population of the state of Minnesota. Uh, not setting targets, not setting quotas, but knowing that we should be drawing this, the students who live here in Minnesota. We also, uh, on all of the campuses, believe in the importance of international students being amongst our uh, Minnesota and other domestic students. The diversity, the global perspectives, the global competence, the ability to adjust to different kinds of cultures and languages, we think all of that is crucial. It's, it's, core, it's part and parcel of the education. Thank you. Regent Swiggum. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, whether I'm speaking to our friends in the legislature, my legislative friends, or the Zimbroda Lions, or the Cannon Falls Rotary Club about the university, there, there's five things that get the attention of the people that they seem to nod and be approval of. One is the recruitment, the increased recruitment of more Minnesota kids. Um, two is our increased retention rates. Um, three, uh, the increased graduation rates, you know, in four years or five years, get not the seven or eight year program. Um, four is the uh, enhanced or increased uh, ACT scores. I think we're at 20 foot point and a half right now. And the last is job placement. Um, uh, me measurements. These are all measurements that we, we that get people's attention. Is it all five of those things together, or are there more that give us our brand as a university that we uh, uh, will try to market for these three thousand 
new kids. What, what, what Mr. McMaster, or, what, is it all five of them that make the brand, or is there anything more important than others? Vice Chancellor. Um, Tara Meyer, Regent Sagan. We've struggled a little bit with this. Those five factors are really important, but there's a qualitative element to being a University of Minnesota graduate that doesn't get caught in those numbers. Uh, so trying to capture the, kind of the spirit, the, the what it means in the heart and soul to be a University of Minnesota graduate is something that doesn't get caught by those numbers. And the legislature may or may not have a, a high amount of interest in them as compared to our graduation rates. But I think we have to capture all of that and communicate all of that in the state to prospective students, families, to legislature, and indeed to all of our constituencies. So, oh, Mr. Chairman, in my message to Minnesota, am I missing something, or are those five oh. factors the most important things? It <laughs> seems to get the nods. It seems to get legislators say, "Yeah, you know, I, I like the retention rates. Uh, recruiting kids, you know, is important. But if you can retain them, you're saving all that money from having to recruit them again, right? They're getting a job placement, getting a product in. That, that seems to be our, our brand. Am I missing something, or should I give a different message?" Yeah. Uh, Chair Omari and Regent Sviggum, I, I think you are missing a piece of this. And in particular, it's the advantage of studying at a research university. Um, students, and we tell the students this constantly, and I think it applies to all the campuses. They're studying with world-class faculty. They're studying with faculty who are creating the knowledge and running the major experiment, experiments and winning the awards. And they're able to do undergraduate research, and within this remarkable urban environment also participate in uh, service learning and internships and so it's a whole package of activities that really enhance the student experience and I think it's, that's one of the reasons that um, we've been so successful. The output of that are all the, well you, you listed the inputs and the outputs of that student experience. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. That's helps me in my presentation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> student Representative Chen is going to wrap us up. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Cheryl Murray, and um, thank you for the presentation. I uh, just have one comment, um, and I'll keep this brief. Um, I guess one thing I want to mention is the international student population. Um, I understand this is a small population in terms of percentage in overall targeting 2024. Um, however, in the table, uh, in the presentation, I think we're still projecting modest increase um, for international students for 2024. Um, I do want to mention that um, I think we've seen some fluctuation over the past years, and then the rhetoric going on here is certainly not really helping a lot of people deciding to come here to pursue uh, a college degree. Um, I guess, I mean, again, this is a small population, uh, but they're bringing in the revenue of our university, and also it relates to our branding. I do, I can't speak for other countries, but I do know that we have a strong presence in China. The Alumni Center is very active there. Um, and just, I'm just thinking that if there's uh, more effort in terms of attracting that, because uh, we are projecting modest um, increase for 2024, but I don't know if that will be the case, because the environment can really change in the upcoming eight years a lot. Any, any response to doing what we can given the, the national environment that's impacting the international desire to come to the U.S.? Chair, my Representative Chen, what we have only begun conversations on is more effective shared recruiting internationally. We've been in conversations with um, uh, Assistant Vice Pro Pro yeah, Pro Provost Meredith McQuaid about how we might collaborate on that more effectively. Uh, international recruiting is very expensive, and so the extent to which we can do that collaboratively, the better off we are. It is a difficult national environment. International applications have fallen fairly drastically in the last couple of years. At the Crookston campus, we're, um, we're turning in part to international recruitment um, as a way to grow our on-campus enrollment. We're pretty young in our thinking about how we do that collaboratively, but we'll take note. We, we, your comment is a good reminder. We need to be thinking harder about that. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as we transition, President Kaler wants to make a comment. Thank you. This has been a good conversation, and we uh, have some takeaways that we'll bring back to you in subsequent presentations and conversations. Uh, we do market to various stakeholders, uh, and our TV uh, is aimed at one of them. We have social media presence that's aimed uh, at, uh, at another one. And uh, if you want to see the difference, you should look at the YouTube video about a, a baby boomer trying to hire a millennial. But on a serious note, I wanted to take this opportunity to again thank Barbara uh, for her service to uh, to Crookston and to the excuse me, I'm choked up about it, uh, and to uh, and to the university. You are a group of uh, a member of a small group of most valuable people. That when uh, we need someone to step into a leadership role or to take on a task, uh, they're there to do it. And you've been one of those, and we'll miss you. Thank you. Thank you, President Kaler. It's thank been my honor. Thank you. Uh, next up, we will have uh, a conversation for discussion that uh, those of us who were at the, the Duluth campus, I believe a little over a year ago now, got an introduction into. Uh, we've titled this Supporting Students in Gateway Courses, um, and I'll turn to the provost to open the item. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari, and members of the committee. Um, indeed, this this uh, presentation was sparked by by that tour of the Duluth campus and by the conversations you had there, in particular about the Securian Math Lab. Um, so, uh, we've asked uh, Bob McMaster, who will stay there, and Vi Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education on the Twin Cities campus, to provide a, a general overview of Gateway courses, what they are, their significance to universities like ours, what we do to manage them and best serve our students. And then Leanne Moline, Associate Vice Provost for Student Success on the Twin Cities campus, will provide examples of programs on the Twin Cities campus that help address issues related to Gateway courses. And I'm Andrea Schocker, uh, Interim Dean of the Swenson College of Science and Engineering on the Duluth campus. We'll follow with information about Gateway courses, especially in, in CSE, and with examples of student support programs, including the Security and Math Lab. Presenters? Yes, uh, Chair Omari and members of the committee, uh, thanks for asking us to discuss Gateway courses. I just did want to make one comment before we start, so my um, uh, the Board of Regents don't think I'm being rude. At 3.25, I have to leave to catch a plane. So uh, if we're not done, I will have to get up and walk out of the room, which I Who do I got to call? Tell them to hold it. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to do that at board meetings. <laughs> Uh, today we want to provide an overview of the U of M strategy to support gateway courses uh, on two of our campuses. Uh, the U of M Twin Cities will start the presentation and Andrea Schocker, who is Interim Dean at Duluth, uh, will give an update on their activities. Um, we're going to start off with a few definitions of gateway courses. Uh, I'm referencing material from the John Gardner Institute. The John Gardner Institute is a national organization that's involved in many undergraduate research projects, a lot of very creative research in this area. And they have defined the gateway course as a college-bearing and or developmental education courses, course that enrolls large numbers of students and have a high and have high rates of D's, F's, withdrawals, and incompletes. Uh, they add to that, uh, especially for low-income first generation and historically underrepresented students. In terms of this definition, I did want to add that on the Twin Cities campus, and I think this is true across the system, we really don't have many developmental courses anymore. Uh, they used to be called zero credit courses and we're kind of out of that game. Uh, one of the major concerns then is around student success in these courses. Continuing with some definitions, uh, a useful classification by the same organization involves gateway classes that are identified as foundational. Uh, these, these courses may be credit bearing, they're credit bearing here, which often serve as initial path, pathways to gateway courses, high risk, courses that have the high DFW rates. We're gonna take a look at some data there and obviously high enrollment courses as well. Uh, there are two flavors of gateway courses, the way we think about it on the Twin Cities campus. Uh, one involves the large number of gateway courses, uh, normally at the 1,000 level, um, that fulfill the general liberal education requirements. 
The second flavor involves those courses that are prerequisites for more advanced coursework. Um, they may not be one of the largest courses in a department, but they're, they're signature courses in getting students through um, the degree. So there are two different types. I also wanted to uh, take a moment to remind the, the board about our liberal education requirements on the Twin Cities campus because again, many of the, the uh, gateway courses will fall within one of these seven core areas uh, or on the following slide, one of the theme areas, although the majority of gateway courses would, would fall within the core, not the theme. I also wanted to mention that we, the Twin Cities uh, campus, were now involved in a process of revisiting and potentially redesigning our liberal education curriculum. There's been a committee meeting for the entire year to do that. So those were the core courses, the theme courses. And Associate Vice Provost Moline is going to make a few comments on uh, an analytic pilot we have ongoing. Mm -hmm. So one example of how we support our students is really is utilizing real-time data of students. And we've been able to pilot with our Moodle course, our Moodle learning system platform, um, providing feedback to faculty as well as to, to advisors about how engaged students are in that classroom. If they have not engaged and logged in to, that, to the Moodle course for two weeks, there's a notification sent. If their grades are not looking comparable to other students and or they are not on the right on track for success for the course, Faculty are notified as well as advisors, specifically when it's two or more courses. So we can certainly step in and try to help help reach out to those students as they're in progress to many courses beyond Gateway, but just many high enrolled courses. We hope to continue that um, and expand it to Canvas when we move to that system in the near future and hope to continue to have see that effort grow. So it might be useful to take a look at some of the data on the Twin Cities campus around these gateway courses and success within the courses. Um, the slide here shows the largest Twin Cities campus majors. And in many ways, enrollments in gateway courses are dependent on the size of the different majors. Um, as you look at this list, the top 20, um, you're not going to be surprised at some. You're probably gonna go going to be surprised at some others. Psychology has been our largest major for the past thousand years. Um, it just is always the largest major. But you can see that it now has grown even more with over a thousand students who major in psychology. What's interesting is economics has now moved into the second position on this campus. And I have to admit that when I looked at the data a few weeks ago, and I hadn't looked at the top 20 in a while, I was very surprised to see economics appear in position number two. Realizing that often students who want to get into the Carlson School, uh, which is very competitive and do not, are, are encouraged to enroll in CLA in, in economics. Computer science, I'm not gonna go through all these, don't worry. Computer science is also a, uh, has witnessed significant growth, and this is a national, uh, a national trend. Uh, computer science as a discipline is just exploding. And what's interesting is that majors in the humanities and majors in social sciences and majors in education, uh, many of them wanna pick up at least a minor in computer science now. Um, you can see the rest of them. I think it's interesting that CFANS uh, has one of the largest uh, uh, majors, animal science. Uh, three of the top 20 occur in the College of Biological Sciences, in large part because they have fewer majors, so you're gonna get more students in each major. So at any rate, you can kind of see the trends here, not the trends, but the numbers, and it relates to the gateway conversation. So this slide shows uh, the DFW rates for a five-year period, 2013 to 2018. We aggregated the data together. Uh, just to remind you, a D is a grade of D, an F is a failure grade, and a W means the student has withdrawn from the class. And we have policies and rules around when you can withdraw from classes. Um, this particular uh, 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 graph is really getting at the, the high enrollment courses. Um, these are the 20 highest enrollment courses on the Twin Cities campus over that period of time. Any course that has over a thousand students in that five-year period is considered high enrollment. 
and for each one of those courses, and you can see here uh, a lot of math science in the DFW list. You can also see the DFW rate for each one of those courses. The highest DFW rate occurs for chemistry 1015, uh, 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 basic chemistry. Uh, this, the, the second highest rate occurs in calculus two, then calculus one, and so on. Again, you see a large number of these that are related to math and chemistry, science, you would see that nationally. There's no surprise there in the DFW rates for those courses. The next slide switches a bit, and now what we're looking at are those 20 courses on campus uh, that are above 1,000 students and have high DFW rates. So you can see Chem 1015, again, is the course with the highest DFW rate on campus, a gateway course. That's some of an issue when 30% of the students who start that course are not completing it for a variety of reasons. I do want to point out to the number two course on this list, um, which is a philosophy course, if you can believe that. Uh, philosophy 1001, Introduction to Logic, which I think is scandalous that the philosophy department <laughs> would be on a DFW list. Uh, we know if Provost Hansen was teaching that course, it wouldn't be on this list. <laughs> uh, and again, I don't think there are a whole lot of surprises as you scan down this uh, in terms of the types of courses where students tend to be struggling a bit more. We're going to cut the data one other way or several other ways here, which I think are interesting. So I mentioned one of the ways of defining a gateway course is foundational. And so these are the most common not required, but the most common courses taken by students in the top 20 majors that were listed before. So this represents in many ways a major pipeline for our students as they traverse the curriculum at the university. And these are the courses that would be problematic because uh, so many students are flowing through them. Again, I won't take time to deconstruct the data other than to say university writing which is the first course listed here, uh, uh, writing 1301, is a university requirement. Every student who comes in and has an ap out of that course has to take university writing. Finally, Good. since I know you like this so much, uh, the, next, the next slice on this involves the required courses. So these are the most required courses taken by students in the top 20 majors before, that I listed before. So many of those majors have requirements. These are actually requirements that they have to take. And you see, again, some of the usual suspects in the DFW list. You see Chem 15, you see Chem 1061. But interestingly, in this required course list, you see public speaking. And you see micro and macro economics appear. So to summarize all this, what we're looking at is we're looking at where students, as they traverse the university curriculum, are struggling to get through these courses, which will often delay them by a semester or a year or worse, and it's something we take very seriously. So we know we bring in a group of talented students to this university, so we want to ensure that they are successful in whatever path they choose. So we do take a multi-pronged approach to how we can provide that support. Um, and I'm going to just briefly talk about a few of them and go a little bit more in depth with, the, with an example. Um, but first and foremost, making sure that through placement testing, we have them in the right course. So we offer placement testing for math, for chemistry, for language. And some recent improvements to our chemistry placement has allowed us to see a 10% decrease in the DFWs for that ten chemistry course 1061 and an increased GPA right off the bat. So we know that if we can get them in the right course, they have a better chance to be successful. Um, we've also seen teaching innovation, the way that students experience the courses that they're in and how they can engage in their learning. And so a great example of that is the math department, who has now implemented flipped course classrooms. And so it's more active learning in, um, styles. And they've seen some expense, or some, I'm sorry, they've seen some success with that as, they, as the decrease in withdrawal rates has occurred, um, increases in students going from pre-calculus to calculus, and also an increase in the percentage of students who successfully complete calculus one. So the experience in the classrooms matter as well. 
I'll touch on midterm alerts and learning support in just a minute, but I would also want to highlight the referrals that we have, the way we care for our students across campus. And so academic advisors play an important role as they hear students are struggling to make sure they can refer them to the right services. And within our A-plus advising note system, we have the ability to tag a referral for a student in that unit to know that they were tagged and we can reach out to, make, to see if they can come in and make sure that they help bridge that gap to, in case students are nervous about that. And we talked a little bit about the data analytics and how we can use and move in the direction of really using that, the data to be more real time and to help be proactive. Thank you. As part of the monitoring of DFW uh, rates, especially for the 1,000 level courses, uh, the U of M has a policy on the submission of midterm grade alerts for students who are, are not performing well in their classes. Um, you can see that this policy applies to Twin Cities, Crookston, Morris, and Rochester. Duluth has a similar policy as well that Andrea could discuss. Um, faculty are encouraged to provide in-progress notifications uh, midway through the semester for those students, again, who are struggling in a, a 1,000 level course. And this would involve if they're receiving at that moment a grade of D, F, or N, and N is not satisfactory in a pass-fail course. So uh, the midterm alerts in practice, again, the idea is that a faculty would need to have a gradable assignment by this point in time, and we greatly encourage faculty to do that. The provost's office encourages early feedback, especially for 1,000 and 2,000 level courses, because these students really need that kind of feedback. Um, you, can, you can see here that there, or we have had some struggles with participation with midterm alerts. Um, we're mindful of that. Uh, I, I need to mention that with the PeopleSoft upgrade from a few years ago, we had to eliminate a great deal of the customization that we had around the midterm grade alert process. And it made it much more cumbersome for faculty to complete them. Um, we've actually redesigned the midterm grade alert uh, system now, and we expect over the next few years with some encouragement and the ease of the, of the submission that these percentages will uh, go back up again. Um, there's also a long-term plan to automate this process where uh, the, the learning management system, in this case Canvas, could actually go in at the midpoint, grab the grades if the grade book's being used, and automatically populate the midterm alerts. So I want to share with you also uh, uh, kind of the, the landscape of the learning support services at the, on the Twin Cities campus at the University of Minnesota. Um, we do have a wide range of services. Oftentimes they're general, general tutoring and academic support. Sometimes they're specialized in the curriculum and the content. And sometimes they're specifically aimed at poppy, different populations and being able to target um, those, those students. And so we recently had, were able to develop this map. It came out of a committee on academic learning support that was um, charged by the Office of Undergraduate Education and the University Libraries to really look at the landscape that we have around these services. Um, and so we learned a lot by being able to kind of track those, where things are located around campus and how we can best serve students. Um, we are now working together to be able to bring these services together a little bit more clearly for students as well as each other and to be able to streamline these, our efforts together. One effort I would like to highlight is our Smart Learning Commons, um, and our, is, which is one of our central areas of support for students. It's again a collaboration between the University Libraries and the Office of Undergraduate Education. It is located in our three major libraries on each of the campuses, so we are on um, the West Bank, the East Bank, and St. Paul. So students have it right there um, in the areas that they're studying that they can get the academic support that they need. And that is a unique model nationally to have the libraries and learning support partner in that way. Our services are free to students, they are provided by well-trained peers, and we provide a variety of uh, services, as you can see, the tutoring of over 200 classes, um, facilitated group studies, which we call PAL, Peer Assisted Learning Sessions. We have media services, so sometimes for those special projects they have to have a video camera or work on some software or something that they're not familiar with, we support them in that effort. And then research consultants, so one-to-one -one work as students are starting to engage in the, the research mission and be able to write their first research paper to have some guidance about finding good sources and being able to construct those, those assignments well. Looking specifically at our tutoring from the Smart Learning Commons, you'll see that the most popular courses that students come in for are around, the, you know, overlap a lot with the courses that you've seen previously. 
Missing from this is chemistry because chemistry provides their own tutoring support within their department and so directs students to those services. But you can see that if, when you look at the information about who's coming in to use the tutoring services, that when we look at the end of the semester that there is improvements in the um, in-house students, their grades that they're receiving in the sense that we have less D's and F's for those students who do come in at least once to get some of that support. So we think that's pointing in, a, in the right direction. I also want to highlight some of those research that we had from a previous study we did a couple years ago around our PAL, PAL sessions. So these are groups that are associated specifically with one class. They meet once a week in small groups and led by a peer facilitator and they do some of the practice problems. They work on trying to you know, get some confidence around the coursework and learn in a group with their peers about how to be able to move through the curriculum or the course content. Um, so we have seen that those students who do actively utilize the PAL sessions see an increase um, in their grades from that semester and so this example is from Math 1031 that was an article published um, just a few years ago. We don't want to undermine, it's not just about the grades. Oftentimes getting this kind of academic support for students is about how they're feeling supported, their self-efficacy, their sense of hope, their community that they're building in those process, in that process. This is especially important for our underrepresented students that oftentimes having that kind of um, community and feeling that support trickles into the other courses that they have, feeling that they do belong here and they do have a place to be able to, that they can do this, this academic leap. And a few other areas I want to highlight um, that uh, provide some central support. We have academic, the Student Academic Success Services. And one of the key features that they have is some, is some course, courses that students can take to help them develop those skills of mastery to be a student, to be an effective student on campus. We do have one specific course that's aimed at our students on probation or that are coming back from suspension to make sure that they can create the right habits to be successful on, uh, and continue. The two other areas, Lindahl Academic Center for Student Athletes and the Multicultural Center for Academic Excellence provide tutoring, academic support, but they're location-based where those students are often found the most. So, of course, over where the athletics, the athletes are over in the um, Beerman Athletic Facilities, and then we have over in Appleby Hall where many of our students are, hang, are hanging out in the Multicultural Center for Academic Success. And finally, uh, sometimes our students aren't hanging out anywhere, they're online. And so we want to make sure that we can give them the support that they need 24-7. And so a recent tool we launched just this year is called Effective You. And this really sits at the intersection of academic success and well-being. Because, the, because it is a lot of, for a lot of reasons students don't do well, this is trying to get at some of the areas that may be stressful for students, where there's some anxiety and where there's some skill building. And so we have a series of modules that students can do online and, and can work through those um, skill building and knowledge, knowledge building as they complete, continue on with that. So that's our University of Minnesota Twin Cities examples that I'd like to highlight, and I'm going to now turn it over to you, Andrew Shocker, the Interim Dean of Swenson College of Science and Engineering at UMD. <laughs> that's a long title. All right, thank you, Regents. Um, I am going to focus a little bit on kind of a case study, so looking specifically at our Swenson College students and some of the initiatives that we've had in the college. Um, and like the Twin Cities data, um, math and science are the big DFW, um, DEF, and withdrawal type classes that we see and so a lot of what we're doing here is affecting not just students in our college but all the way across the entire UMD campus. So I'm going to focus on four things. The first one is engaged learning, and this is kind of our word in the college for what you might have heard as active learning or, um, or experimental type learning um, or flipped classrooms. We kind of lump that into one place because our goal is to engage the students in that learning process, that it's not just a lecture type um, activity. And that's helped a lot in some of these um, gateway courses for us. Um, we have a special bridge program for summer courses that I'll talk about, um, and then we have a learning Learning Commons also and that uh, resides in our library and part of that Learning Commons is our Security and Mathematics Lab and that's the specific case I'll talk to you about right at the end of this group of slides. So a major is initiative for our college is the enhanced learning. So the, the previous dean started engaging this um, for the college. His goal was to have the whole college or the majority of the classes in the college flipped active or some kind of engaged learning within the next decade. We are probably close to 50% there, if I had to, to guess at where we are. Um, we have... Um, 
picked this up and we now have critical mass to where people want this to be done. So to give you a real quick example, enhanced learning or this type of learning is actually not easy for most faculty members. It's great for the students, but instead of preparing and lecturing on the board and knowing exactly what's going to happen, this looks a lot more like chaos sometimes, but it does a lot better with, um, for the students to grasp the topics. So they're really engaged in the topics, they're not just hearing it. And so you may have them do some pre-work at home and then they come to the classroom ready to engage, they're working in groups, they're being asked to give feedback and engage in the process the entire time. As a faculty member, that means you're not real sure what's going to happen that day. For me, that's a good thing, it's a fun thing, and it's, it's helped some of our more senior faculty also get a new lease on the classroom and more excitement. Um, but it takes a little while for people to buy in and understand what it is, particularly if they've already been successful in the classroom in the lecture format, they don't want to mess with something they feel is, is going well. We initially Initiated this with a few faculty cohorts, um, focusing on the folks who wanted to do this and um, and engaging some of our new faculty as they came in. Um, we cut, I'll often call them book groups because what we did was engage around a certain title, um, a book that we would um, have say ten, a book a group of ten, read a certain book about active learning or engaged learning, and then we'd meet on a biweekly or on an every two week basis. Could be off campus, it could be at someone's house, could be on campus and just talk about that chapter of the book and then talk about how we would do that in our classroom. So small snippets. By next time, try one of these things in your classroom. But what it also did, particularly in my group, which was all women in the STEM fields, it engaged folks to talk to each other about the struggles they were having. So people, about half of that time was spent coming in and saying, wow, I had a disaster class today. I really am feeling not, I, I'm not sure this is working. And everyone would jump in and say, wow, when that happened to me, here's a couple things I did. So you could leave that day with tools to go into your next classroom and succeed and give the students the best information possible. <laughs> As we're getting critical mass on this, what you find out is the students are also learning how to be an engaged classroom. The first person who gets them when they haven't had this, uh, particularly in my engineering classes, is a lot of blank stares. Um, come on, engage. Uh, you just get blank stares. But we're at the point now where the students expect this. They um, are really succeeding with this type of learning. And I'll talk about some specific classes for that. We have regular workshops for faculty um, so that we always have something coming in new and exciting for folks who've not done much of the active learning before, as including some of the, the more senior faculty, and we do a lot of peer mentoring. Whether if you're stumbling blocks technology, you have someone sit down with you and do that. So there's not necessarily a center we go to as faculty, but there are peers. We want this to succeed and it helps all of us. So I'm going to give you an example. We um, started out with pushing this pretty heavily in some gateway courses. So um, two courses with high DFW rates, or when I was in engineering school, unfortunately those were called the weed out courses. Um, we don't believe in having those as weed out courses. These students who are coming to these classes are students we've admitted because we believe they should succeed. So we've already pre-qualified these students that they should succeed in these classes. So it is a two-way street. Both the student and faculty member have to be on board. But what we're finding is with this type of enhanced learning, we're getting that engagement. We aren't making something easier. We're not watering it down. None of those things are happening. What we're ha having is students that actually know the material when they leave the class. So when I see one of these students from physics or chemistry in my engineering class as a junior, they know the stuff. They didn't just have it and get an A. They actually know it and can engage right away in learning. And so all of us benefit and the students benefit the most. So this can take forms of demonstrations in class, group activities in class, but the students spend more time talking than the faculty lecturer does. So the faculty member is facilitating this. So I can give you an example as a student. When I was in engineering school, you know, we do a lot of group work and things like that, but I went to a lecture. I kind of saw what was going on in the lecture. I wrote note, I took notes and then I went back home and I spent a lot of time either by myself or in a group trying to figure out how to start the problems. Well, if I've got the expert, why don't I read the stuff ahead of time, go to the classroom, have the expert tell me what they're thinking when they start that problem, because that's what I need help on. I don't need help on the math. I need help in that class. In the math class, you need help on the math. But I don't need help in that. I need to understand how they think to engage. And so that's why this has been a super success. In chemistry, this was really interesting. We had a faculty member who was teaching three sections of the same chemistry class, and so he taught the exact same material, same book, same everything, same material in each 
lecture, um, but one of the classes was uh, more of flipped and engaged style. Halfway through the semester, the difference in the scores on the exact same tests um, for those students was so dramatic that we kind of say if it had been a drug tile, we had, would have had to stop it because we were not helping the students who weren't getting the active um, uh, type of class style. So we have converted our um, gateway courses in chemistry, physics, and math completely to this type of engaged learning, and those DFW rates are plummeting. And it's a very exciting thing because it also means I don't see the same student three times in the same class. That's not good for anybody. And they're able to move on and succeed. Um, we have one that started a couple years ago with one of our math faculty. It's a bridge program specifically for underrepresented groups and first generation students who are coming into UMD. They may need a little bit of catch up on math to come in um, to get a jump start. So some th these are in basic math, intro algebra, algebra, and pre-calculus. So let's say it's an engineering student who maybe had didn't have calculus in their rural high school or maybe didn't have the level that they feel comfortable going in the class. They take this, it's a self-paced online class, and then they have a special couple days before classes start where they come in as a cohort. So they know each other before they ever land in the classroom officially at UMD, and they know that they have the skill set. It has been amazing what this course has done for these students. Um, this group of students who often have the most challenges coming in with retention, this group of students actually has better retention than my other um, cohort at UMD, the rest of the students in the sciences and math. Um, we are continuing this program and, and expanding this as much as we possibly can. And it shows even with an online option, if there is some cohort piece to this, that you can have great success. All right, our learning commons includes a couple things. Um, we also did this in the library. I think that is, I agree, that is kind of the state of the art thing to do. Uh, make the library more active. It's the hub of learning. And so we have our tutoring center there. Our tutoring center is all peer driven. So that's all students tutoring students. And interestingly, some of the ones who had to be there the most to get tutoring are the best tutors because they knew the struggles to get through it. Um, we have a writer's workshop, which I won't go into detail, but obviously assists with the writing for students in those classes. Supportive services are things like our bridge program, and then our Securian Math Learning Lab, which is just a couple years old. Um, the goal of our math group, and we have a, a senior math um, faculty who works in this area for her scholarship, look, looking at how students engage with math. The goal is math problems without frustration. So if you, you weren't big on math and you had a lot of frustration as you went through the problems, the idea is here, let's t set up an environment where it's not frustrating, but it's engaging. So we replaced a lot of the lectures with labs. So they go to lecture one time a week, and the rest of the time they're sitting in this um, learning lab. It has a special instructional software that's interactive, so it grows with you. You make a mistake, it helps you figure out what you did and move on to the next thing. Um, a lot of practice problems, but it's also on-demand personal assistance. So instead of having just a faculty member doing a lecture, we have four or five TAs who do different shifts walking around during this class lab time as well as after hours. So nighttime, students can come into this lab and work through at their own pace. And this has been very successful. Right now we do, um, we started out with kind of the base level math and are kind of working our way up to the calculus series because this has been so successful with students um, coming out with what they need from the math classes as well as having very little frustration while they get there. I think that's it. And so this is staffed by, um, we actually didn't increase the number of faculty to do this. We have um, GTA, so graduate teaching assistants. We use a lot of the undergraduates, which is a way to have peer mentoring and additional peer tutors here. The self-paced piece helps with the frustration so the students don't feel like they're behind from the beginning, particularly if you came from a high school where you didn't have some of this material before. It doesn't make you feel from the first week that you're always behind. Um, and it's a combination of individual and group work. And the space we have here is really nice because we can do this sort of thing in the normal classroom and we don't don't wait for a fancy classroom to start engaging in this type of activity, but having a classroom that's conducive to it really helps us um, with this type of learning so the students can share. So that's just an example from UMD. 
thank you to the presenters. Uh, I know uh, Vice Provost McMaster has to head out, so thank you for uh, the two presentations. Uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Members, uh, I know this is a very uh, important and topic of interest, and so uh, we, we had time slotted for a 15-minute break. We will probably work through that, um, and instead of having a, a break, everyone will just get up and shake out after this uh, agenda item. Uh, it actually helps with our decision-making process. <laughs> Um, so I saw Regent Shu's hand go up, and I saw some other hands go up, so we'll start the list. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari. Thank you, presenters. Um, this is a very uh, important topic, obviously, looking at the numbers. I um, was hoping to get a little bit more of a breakout of the DFWs, you know, how many Ds, how many Fs, how many Ws, as opposed to just as a group. Um, as we all know, Cs get degrees. Ds are just below Cs. So uh, if we have a lot of people getting Ds, um, you know, obviously we have to fix that. And, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if we kind of can isolate, you know, problems with specific classes. You got it down to the class level, but then can you get it down to the, you know, the actual instructor level so you know that this instructor is giving more Ds than this instructor or whatever. And, you know, I think if you can isolate it down, you can figure out what the problem is. I, I know from my experience, and this is 35 years ago, um, there were faculty or you know teachers, I don't know if, uh, if they were grad students or whoever they were, but they were lecturing and I couldn't understand them. And I think it's still a problem today because I hear about it all the time. And I know we have standards and you know it's just not right for a student to have to teach him or herself um, how to do the work out of a, a textbook that maybe isn't even being completely used for the class. Maybe, you know, maybe there's not enough in the textbook to really teach the material. And that's another thing, the high cost of textbooks. But, um, you know, they shouldn't be going on Khan Academy to learn something that we're supposed to be teaching them because they're paying us. And I think, you know, in the old days, you know, we had uh, we w would go into a lecture hall and they would push out a big TV on a cart and a VCR and we would watch a tape of the professor doing problems. You know, this is physics or math or whatever, engineering. And, you know, today obviously with the advent of the internet, um, you should be able to sit at home and watch those kinds of videos. And I don't know if we're doing any of that, but it sounds like the UMD solution is working. Um, I would be interested in seeing the statistics to prove that, you know, you've got those numbers going down and, and how you're doing it because I think it's a, it's a big problem. It affects our uh, graduation rates, it affects our retention rates, you know, because if, if you, uh, you're if you not getting passing grades your first year, or your first semester, your parents are probably saying, hey, look, you're in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're not uh, in the wrong place, but maybe you're just having a hard time with a little bit of bad luck in, in terms of what classes you signed up for. Um, so anyway, I think this is very important. I'm glad um, to have the presentation on it, but I think we can um, obviously keep an eye on this and hopefully see some better results. So the last thing is, is you showed us five years worth of data, but you didn't show us each year. So is it getting better or worse or is it staying the same? You know, that would be interesting to know. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Shu. Before I turn to see if there's any responses, just point of clarification, what's a VCR? <laughs> Good one. Well, before that, it was Betamax. <laughs> uh, any, any of the two of you want to respond to any of the comments? And if, if not, that's okay, but there was a lot in there, so. I'll just briefly respond, Regent Shu, Regents of the committee. Um, I think the model you were talking about, you had a lot going on in that question, but in the model you were talking about from when a lot of us were at school where you did um, sometimes not get a lot out of the lecture and have to work on your own, and there was some pride to some professors in having a high fail rate. That was some kind of yep. special thing. Yep. This is not where we are now, I don't think, on any of the campuses. I'll speak to my own experience at UMD. Um, as far as we do look at who's teaching what sections and what those rates are, and it, it actually gets sent out to the individual departments. Um, everybody knows who's where, and we sit down and say, what what are the issues here? Is it, um, you know, this was a different class coming in than we've had in the past, this is an anomaly? Is this um, someone's trying a different teaching method? What's actually going on here? And then 
as a group, that faculty and that department will talk about, okay, how are we going to move forward? How are we going to either change this, improve it, or maybe someone else would like to also take a stab at doing these courses. They are um, a lot of time. They take a lot of, it's a time-consuming venture, but they're also very rewarding. And so certain types of faculty um, are drawn to this type of course. But you're right. I think it's just such a different experience than it used to be there that, that um, that's a big piece of what we're seeing. And I'll make sure we get some numbers to you from our side. Thank you. Uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Omari. And uh, I, I think Dr. McMaster left, but uh, I have to speak for my colleague to the right here. Five slides and 100 courses, and there's not one reference to a mortuary science. He's kind of disturbed. <laughs> He was searching because he said something about DFs or Ws in those courses. So all seriousness, um, I noted just one kind of a curiosity, not one, despite having three of the top 20 majors, there's not a Carlson DFW class for Carlson School of Management, and I don't know why that is or if that reflects anything about that school. I'm just, that's just pure curiosity. But more on the substantive side here, I'm wondering as we think about limited resources to do everything we're doing today, back to our morning conversation about budgets, mm -hmm. we probably can't keep doing everything we're doing or we got to do something different. How should we be thinking at a very macro level as, as members of the board of this institution about the resources it's going to take, whether that is staff, whether that's faculty, whether that's, whether that's specialized equipment to do engaged learning or smart services. To this region, both sound more expensive than a person in front of a giant lecture room with a, with a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. Am I thinking about that the right way? Is there enough refinement in that question for you to answer it? Just help me start thinking about governance level, smart services, engaged yeah. learning yeah. type of schools. Okay. And, and uh, Regent um, McMillan, I, I think that one of the slides that might be helpful is the smart learning commons where they're showing the percentage of drop off for DFWs mm -hmm. for those who have visited and those who haven't because I had the same mindset that you had. So. Um, who wants to take a shot at it? Yeah. Um, I'll begin. So Chair Amari and uh, I'm sorry, I'm Regent McMillan. Um, I think one way that we think about it is, you know, you, I heard the earlier discussion about who we're bringing in and our enrollment and, and who we're bringing to campus. And I, I think part of that conversation needs to be the ways that we support students um, and how we make sure that they are successful as they go through. We've seen, I'm sure you've had conversations around mental health issues on campus, the levels of support that our students need when they're on our campus as they kind of, the delayed adulting as we look at some of the, um, the developmental theories for students, that there is a little bit more of that trans, um, transitional stage of being able to develop some of the skills for them to be successful. And that right now has been one-to-one. -one. It's building relationships with students and really helping them um, be able to approach that in a supportive, a supportive community. Um, but I do think incentivizing as best we can. We, we have some efficiencies. I think we can look at how we provide our services and using technology to make that more accessible to students when 24 seven and there's some free options out there. Um, but I do think we could take a better look at how we incentivize faculty to be able to you know, really turn their classes into flipped and active engaged learning environments. Um, and then also part of it is stigma. Students are coming in used to being the really head of their class and really you know, strong students and then when they come in and we say, um, at the table at orientation, we'll say, here's some tutoring support. And they're like, well, how can I be a tutor? I don't need tutoring support. Um, so they're still in the mindset of being there. They've been very strong students. And so we have a little bit of stigma attached with going in to ask for help um, and to utilize these services. So we're working on normalizing that, embedding it into the curriculum so that those support mechanisms are part for equal there for everyone. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chair McMurray, Regent McMillan, I would add um, that on the expense piece, I think yes, it is more research or resource intensive. Um, clearly, if you're doing a lecture to 300 students and have one body in front of the lecture versus the type of interaction we're talking about here, it is at least in the transition and the start is more expensive. And that's been daunting. Um, the one incentive our faculty want to see to do this is simply to have the resources to add the people that they need to do it, um, not a personal incentive. Um, but if you think about what this means, so this also means if I have 30% of the students in those classes failing or getting Ds or withdrawing, now maybe I have 10% or less of those students 
you know, that is a, it may be more resources at first, but it's absolutely the best use of resources and our point to be here is for success. So if a student graduates in four years instead of five, that might be less tuition, but we sure did a better job of getting that student to where they needed to be as well as using our own resources um, the most effectively. Thank you. Regent McMillan, follow up? Yeah, thank you. They're great answers. Thank you very much. Um, did I see them playing croquet in chemistry? That, <laughs> that was not an option when I was there, and I might not have had a DF or a W physics. in organic <laughs> chemistry. So, uh, Last comment, Regent Powell. <laughs> um, th thank you for uh, thank you for the work. It's it's encouraging. It's encouraging to see the results uh, from some of these initiatives. So a couple of well, the first comment is looking at that cor the course list of you know rank from high to low DFWs. Um, my reaction to that was. Um, I felt, I mean, I got a little lightheaded when I looked at that, and, and, I, and a lot of exam nightmares, less, it, all, it brought it all back. So, um, so on the, um, so on for the gateway courses, um, this question is about sort of variability of preparation, so here's a little story. Um, I, I can't remember which course it was, but I, I think my daughter took the, uh, many years ago, the gateway chemistry class, and one of her comments was, she said, look, some of the students who are taking this class basically took the same class in high school using the same book. And so there, I mean, so, and then you have everything, you know, on either side of that. And so I guess the, the question is, is you guys can't solve all problems, but is there a, is there a, a play that involves being very clear to Minnesota high schools anyway about, you know, look, this is the level of work that you need to be able to do or the level of preparation that you need in order to come into these classes and do well because as you say there some of them are a real wake up call for first time freshmen and you're not in Kansas anymore and 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 and, and some of the students around them are maybe way better prepared so that's the that's the first question, and the other one is, you know, you you evaluated better than a C, you know, or worse than a, you know that line. I think on on a change in outcomes, mm -hmm. so and I think that's great, but I guess the reality is for students who are interested in, you know, going on to medical school or graduate schools. I mean, C is not good enough. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's really more. I mean, you got to really excel, and so it, it, everything you're doing here is great, but. I'd be interested in your comments on both those points. Sure, Chair McMurray, um, Regent Powell. I will, to start with the one about the different backgrounds, that is more and more true through my career as a faculty member. You're seeing students from very different backgrounds. My own experience, I went to a high school in the Ozarks of Missouri. I was not prepared, though. I was a top-notch student, but I was not prepared in any way for the experience. And I sat with the students at, in a, you know, a lot of pre-med pre students and watched that happen. Um, the big difference here is, the engaged learning helps with that because now we're not sitting and just learning out of the book. We're sitting and those same students who've had this before who maybe didn't actually learn it necessarily but who had it before are peers and working with the students to catch up um, who are in those groups. And those other students who maybe didn't have that same prep are still at the table discussing it because there's a, a lot of, um, it's, it's not just out of the book. And so that helps. And I remember in my classes just feeling like, well, there's no way I can do well because I'm so far behind. That goes away to a little extent when you're doing this type of engaged learning. And so for me as a faculty member, that has made that job for me a lot easier a lot better because it used to be I'd sit in there and say, well, do I, who do I teach to? The kid who already gets it all, the one who's really, really struggling or to the middle of the row. Well, all, wherever you choose, there's a lot of unhappy people there. So I think this helps address it. What to do with the high schools and some of that, I think not all, all of them are resourced the same. So it is a real, a real tough thing, but it does help to have some expectation of what that engagement is. And I would add two comments. One is that I've heard from academic advisors about when it is in high school that students are taking, for example, chemistry, and sometimes it's 10th grade. Mm -hmm. So by the time they get there, it's like, oh wait, you know, that's been a big gap of learning. So that's kind of refreshing that. Um, our chemistry department, I think, is doing a really great job with looking at their testament placement is really about uh, learning modules. And so students are spending at least 15 hours in that over the summer trying to get the, like, do I have the right competencies to start at this level? So they're kind of doing a crash course in the summer to make sure that they are starting out right. And again, we've just started that last year and I think it's really showing some good promise. So hopefully they can learn, a, refresh their brains a little bit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you both for uh, a wonderful and important presentation. Uh, members, we're going to take a, a very fast three minute break for everybody to shake, stretch, do what you need to do, and then we'll reconvene uh, with our
second to last agenda item. What's all this talk about?
we're going to begin with the next item. I always, I always know a three minute is a five minute, and it's exactly five minutes. So um, we are going to move to um, an item that I apologize that we had to move last month, but I don't know if the presenters were more happy or sad or what. But here we are um, to discuss the ever important 21st century outreach mission, which is the third part um, of this uh, series of discussions and presentations. In this one, we are looking at a vision for the university's outreach mission. And I will ask Karen Hansen to make some opening remarks, please. Thank you, Chair Amari, and, and members of the board. A as the chair has mentioned, this is the third part of a, of a discussion. So we'll just ask you to recall that part one of the conversation was in October with Deans Brian Burr and Bev Durgan, who spoke to you about university extension and our research and outreach centers. In part two, in December, Associate Vice President Andy Furco, joined by faculty from the School of Dentistry, the Carlson School of Business, and a graduate student from the Humphrey School and the School of Design, he was in both, talked about the integration of teaching, research, and service through the reciprocity of public engagement. We've tried to give a broad brush picture with some specific examples of 21st century university outreach and public service, its significance for our state and its interconnectedness with our teaching and research missions. This third session was planned to give you an additional opportunity to discuss uh, University of Minnesota outreach with each other to delineate further a vision for the university's outreach and public service mission. Um, I might also just mention two other recent presentations related to outreach and the shaping of the board's vision. The first was the 2017 accountability report presented in December and approved in February which includes a robust report about the university's outreach and public service work over the past year. And the second was a strategic planning conversation with Vice President Matt Kramer in December. Much of that discussion, as you recall, concerned the importance of communicating the work of the university to our various publics. In the docket, we noted that outreach can be parsed in more than one way. The first understanding of outreach and public service locates them uh, as a key element in our tripartite mission. The other understanding of outreach is focused on the messages we send to our various external constituents and the general public. These latter clearly bear on the delivery of our mission. Vice President Matt Kramer kindly agreed to join our conversation today to elaborate further on this communication role. Vice President Al Levine is also with us and will be able to draw upon uh, his wealth of experience, uh, which come from layers of his career at the University of Minnesota as a professor, as a food scientist, as a college dean, and now as Vice President for Research, to show how mission-related outreach work is connected throughout the university. So. Uh, the, uh, as I noted, the university's com commitment to outreach and public service is articulated in its mission statement. To extend, apply, and exchange knowledge between the university and society by applying scholarly expertise to community problems, by helping organizations and individuals respond to their changing environments, and by making the knowledge and resources created and preserved at the university accessible to the citizens of the state, the nation, and the world. Um, we deliver on this part of the university mission, which includes meeting the changing needs of Minnesota's communities through collaborations across all five system campuses and with every part of the state. We connect our resources and expertise with the needs of external stakeholders to advance the common good, to address the most urgent problems of our state and world, to foster innovation and economic growth, to engage students in community-based learning, workplace, and service experiences, and to enhance the quality of life. The roots of this aspect of our mission stem, in part, from our legacy as a land-grant university. You're well aware of this designation. We sketched it in the docket, um, a, a few more details about our status as a land-grant institution. But I want to underscore the importance of this origin story. We do have a special responsibility to work to improve the well-being of our state, our nation, and the world, and the health and lives of our citizens. The specific functions of a land-grant institution have certainly evolved since 1862, but there's a core spirit and sense of key responsibilities that are constitutive of our identity. That spirit informs and shapes our activities and aspirations today. 
moreover, even as federal action, the, uh, the, the Morrill Act is part of our origin story, in 2018, new elements of our partnerships at the national level are shaping the way in which we pursue our mission. Federal funding of research grants and in, um, uh, increasingly asks for evidence of public outreach and community impacts. I mean, that's new. Alavine will elaborate on this further, but I want to note that this is a regular part of the work of many of our faculty, not just those you might think of first in, say, agriculture or in health sciences. In fact, outreach and public service is specifically identified among the criteria used in tenure and promotion um, for all our schools and campuses. <clears throat> Our 21st century outreach vision reflects our commitment to expanding our impact. And the University of Minnesota is in fact seen as a national leader in, de in deepening the university's outreach and engagement with communities and embedding community-based experiences in our outreach, research, and teaching missions. Our 21st century public engagement agenda extends our expertise not only to or for our communities, we also work with our communities, businesses, and external stakeholders in longer term partnerships to address complex issues and to optimize the use of the assets and resources of all involved. Outreach thus is deeply embedded in our work and faculty and staff are quite purposeful and accountable as they allocate resources or efforts to outreach work. As I mentioned, these are some, they're sometimes directly accountable to a granting agency. Sometimes they're accountable through unit specific faculty review and promotion processes. Um, for discussion, however, we're, we're articulating here for your consideration some principles the university might use to gauge and guide investments related to outreach. Um, and they're listed there, uh, clear community need, special university expertise. Do we have an ability to serve compared to other programs in Minnesota or peer institutions? Um, our capacity for this kind of service uh, among our faculty and staff and students and the potential for impact or the opportunity to, the, the, that's provided to pr improve lives, eliminate or mitigate problems or enhance the common good. And finally, um, opportunity for academic synergies that connect the outreach and service missions with the research and discovery and teaching and learning elements of the mission. So these proposed principles articulated and delineated slightly differently are described more fully in your docket. They do align with the current criteria for academic investment that we discussed together at your February meeting. Um, when we conclude our presentation and begin to discuss your vision for the outreach mission, I'd, I'd particularly welcome your thoughts about those um, proposed principles. Um, but I'm just introducing this, so I want you to hear from my colleagues. First from um, Vice President Matt Kramer, who will comment briefly about the communication aspects of outreach. And then from Vice President Al Levine, who will share his perspectives about how outreach is integrated with other aspects of the mission throughout the university. Please, Vice President Kramer. Uh, Mr. Chair, Provost members, thank you. I'll be very brief as our role is principally um, taking in the activities that is happening in outreach and service and finding ways to amplify it and extend that message. You know, connecting our work with the citizens of the state serves to demonstrate value and directly links the university to our fellow citizens. We build awareness of the resources and expertise we have, create advocates at the local level, and demonstrate the integral way that our work improves the life of our fellow citizens. The impact of our outreach can be measured in several different ways. And we look for these opportunities when we're telling these stories. First, it can be oftentimes about how we're teaching our students how to become practitioners in their fields, using real research in the community as a way of extending their professional expertise and career experience. It can be about the communities we serve and the way their lives will change as a result of our work or research. And finally, it can be about the lasting, uh, the lasting impact of the engagement that we create for the state of Minnesota, whether it's in human health, the quality of our communities, we're building a stronger society. University Relations leverages all the channels that you're already aware of in telling these stories. We supply the tools, training, and amplification to the communicators in the colleges who are directly supporting the researchers doing outreach and service. We believe that this is integral to our mission, and by doing this, we extend our service to the state of Minnesota and demonstrate connection with the University of Minnesota. Mr. Chair, Provost, thank you. 
Vice President <coughs> Levine. Chair Omari, members of the board. Um, you know, I remember when I was a faculty member, a young faculty member, I might get called by a church or a community group to go out and talk. And I'd go out there and I'd start saying things about how optogenetics is used to find the neural networks about histo histidine, proline, diketopiperacine, and how it affects food intake. <laughs> it was very effective. My talk was extremely effective when I did that. So what's happened now, we're trying to connect research and outreach in a way that people actually understand it. And uh, a lot of you have heard of the Alan Alda Center and the kind of work that's been done to try to help faculty get engaged with the community and explain things in a manner which they can understand. Um, in the area of connecting faculty with their community, we have a challenge. And last year, a group of college communicators from CBS, CSE, and later many others came together with our office and the Institute on the Environment and University Relations to create a conference called Speaking Science. In the end, we had 15 university units and colleges who sponsored the event, and the event sold out within hours after being released to the university community at large. The Institute on the Environment was able to leverage existing curriculum from their Boreas leadership program for graduate students, and INE took on a central role in organizing this event. Um, the result was that on a snowy day in January, 400 University of Minnesota scholars, from grad students to senior faculty, came together. They took part in the improvisation and communication exercises with the Alda Center for Communications. They heard from Carl Zimmer of the New York Times, one of the top science writers in the nation, and they also participated in breakout sessions that include mock interviews with dozens of local journalists who provided immediate feedback about how to frame their research in the most compelling way possible. And researchers and journalists both left excited and energized about the work that was going on at the University of Minnesota. Minnesota. One faculty member who has had extensive media training and experience said that this event was the strongest collection of high quality sessions in a single day that was experienced, that he ever experienced. Um, we're going to offer this conference again next year, January 17, 2019. You're welcome, you should come to it. We hope to broaden and deepen offerings to more people with different levels of skills and ensure other system campuses participation. All in all, this has been a great collaborative effort. Another example of the kind of work that we do, um, I happen to be on the board of the State Fair Foundation, and we all know that the State Fair, it's located right next to the St. Paul campus. It's always had a connection to the University of Minnesota. We have the 4-H building there, which has always been part of extension. We have Horticultural Sciences that presents there, the Dairy Building, other our regular University of Minnesota building. But recently, we developed this new D2D building, Driven to Discover, a dedicated faculty recognize the opportunity that you know, two million annual fair visitors come to this event, and here's a place where we could really get some subjects for research and also discuss our research. Um, our office helped fund this program along with the School of Public Health, the School of Medicine, and CFANS. And a bigger group, including the AHC and the libraries, pitched in and helped create a new 2,400 square foot facility which opened at last year's fair. I don't know, did any of you go out there and see that? It's a, it's a really great building. Um, small but effective in its way. Um, the D2 facility had 60,000 visitors, up 35% from the previous year. We had 31 research teams that were involved in four to eight studies going at any one time. It, was, it won the D2D building, won the Best of the Fair Award last center, and state fairs across the country are interested in replicating this. Um, it's involved 80 university departments to date, and this year this will include researchers from UND as well as collaborations with other universities, Hamlin, Concordia, Mayo Clinic, and Minnesota Department of Transportation, Motor Vehicles, and Health. Um, the projects are often very fascinating, everything from kids' reactions to physiological stress to taking photos of people's optic nerves to the great Minnesota sports concussion study. There's been a lot of information there, and greater Minnesota constituencies have been very interested in this. We also have connected um, centers and councils. One of the ones I'd like to turn to now, th these are some of those centers, is the... Um, 
the Center for Transportation Studies, which is a, um, a center that reports to our office. It's been active for 30 years. They just had a conference here in the Twin Cities where they had other centers from around the country. I think there were 92 or more from other universities that came here. Like the Institute on the Environment, which I mentioned before, this center can provide nimble and valuable connections outside of the U to private sector, to public policy. They manage a whole variety of strengths and offerings. It's a critical place to bring other disciplines around transportation issues. Um, the center works on rural safety. You've probably seen electronic signs at intersections on rural side highways that they've helped develop. They study best practices in living snow fences. They look at the big picture about how easily people in the 50 largest metro areas can get to jobs with the current transportation mix. And they're now working on tribal transportation safety with, with four of our Minnesota tribes. They offer programs like the Minnesota Local Technical assistance program which meets the nuts and bolts needs of communities in Minnesota. Their training and technical assistance programs involved 8,300 people around the state last year including a two-day training on best practices in road grading offered in four sites across greater Minnesota. In addition to its programs, the CTS board, which I serve on, also connects public and private sectors, leaders across and around transportation issues. We also have a community oversight board, which was established to take a, it's an independent board integrated into our research enterprise, created to ensure that the community voices are heard related to the 9,000 active University of Minnesota scholars that have programs that involve human participants in it. As the board is aware, we revamped and improved our human participant research program beginning in 2015, and as part of that, we sought a permanent and formal connection to the community, and the community um, oversight board helped serve that. It's composed of external academic, professional, and community experts in human participant research and research ethics. It's led by Paul Matesich, who's the executive director of research at the Wilder Foundation, and includes advocates for people with mental illness, a former mayor of Minneapolis, the CEO of North Point in North Minneapolis, among others. And they meet quarterly. I go to those meetings, help organize them. They have responsibilities which include, prov include providing feedback on research-related policies, strategies, procedures, practices in the protection of research participants. So in sum, I think this board's role is still evolving. They're looking at what their job description should be in terms of this kind of work. So along with connecting this research, we want to talk about the technology commercialization. Technology commercialization in this area, our office, as you know, we license university technology to establish companies and launch new companies to help research discoveries move beyond the laboratory and into the marketplace. They are highly ranked and they've launched more than 120 companies since 2006 with a high rate of survival. It is survival with a new company and success. In April, our OTC was nominated as a finalist for the 2018 Tech Transfer Unit of the Year Award by Global University Venturing, a London-based publication. Last month, OTC held a, a showcase on neuromodulation technology for potential investors in connection with the Use Medical Device Conference and Neuromodulation Symposium. It's highlighted, it highlighted the interdisciplinary strengths at the U of M and was another example of how well OTC is integrated into our research enterprise. You've all heard about MinDrive. We've been very successful in that area with a whole host of people involved. I've mentioned this many times before. I just wanted to bring it up again and remind you that we have a new MinDrive um, effort in cancer clinical trials. Last year, the legislature put funds into this area. It's aimed at improving cancer outcomes for all Minnesotas th through greater access to clinical trials in prevention and treatment. Over the course of the next year, the network's going to establish a total of 18 new clinical trial locations throughout the state with more to come in the years following. Um, I believe we have more opportunities to work with the state on other MinDrive modeled initiatives, such as I've mentioned before, such as opioids and aging. I also wanted to mention our Nexus space. 
in terms of connected spaces and resources. Technology commercialization and its venture center are now part of this space. It's a 30,000 square foot space housing several university units that all face outward from U of M on the second floor of this building. The Nexus space brings university faculty, staff, and students together with businesses, entrepreneurs, economic development leaders to form new collaborations. As you can see in the slide, it features open spaces and presentation conferencing capabilities. And then finally, what I'd like to mention is Last month, we co-convened a shared solution addiction summit on opioids here in the Twin Cities with March, M-A-R-R-C-H, the state's main organization of drug and alcohol counselors. It represents more than 75 agencies and individuals. This is an example of us offering our facilities to the community, but we also played an important role in quickly organizing this event. Deb Wamsley, Director of Graduate Studies of the Integrated Behavioral Health and Addictions Counseling Programs at Continuing Ed, and Lynn Schoen from the University of Minnesota Foundation helped this large organization come to campus in relatively short time. The summit was designed to bring all stakeholders targeting together to outline the state of the state on opioid addiction in Minnesota, build a call to action, and encourage collaboration. It was a great example of the convening that we can do and how we work with our outside groups. In the photo, you see Congressman Tom Emmer speaking passionately about the impact opioid addiction has had on people he knows and his interest in solutions. So I hope we've shown you today some of the examples of the kind of outreach this university is so well engaged to do and will continue to do. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, to the presenters. I, I want to first draw attention, and I believe there's discussion uh, question. Thank you. Um, to the beginning of the presentation with Executive uh, Vice President and Provost Hanson as she outlined some definitions, uh, and the docket materials had a good uh, revisiting of what the, the land grant is, the subsequent uh, federal acts that had been passed. Uh, after that and how that informs the work that we do. And so I want to make sure that we focus on some of those definitions that are in the docket um, and then also focus on these two um, governance questions that we have here. So the floor is open. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Murray. Um, so I'm looking at Slide, I guess it's 96, it's the OVPR, Academic Centers and Institutes. And, and I'm, I'm going to ask this in a way that like, goes way back to when President Kaler started and identified as one of his priorities, how do we prioritize among 370 some centers and institutes. And I think in our materials attached to the budget, we saw that 23 have gone away. So I preface that not as a question about how do we further eliminate centers and and, research, and and institutes, but how do we, like you put eight on this slide and you show them as Office of Vice President of Research Academ um, Academic Centers and Institutes, how as we, and this may be as much for President Kaler as, as either of our Vice Presidents there, how do we go about connecting a system-wide strategic plan with where to drive resource investments in centers and institutes that are the most consequential at helping us with our outreach mission. I don't know if you put these eight on here, Vice President Levine, because they are the most consequential or if they just popped up. Where does that conversation occur between the provost, the president, you two, and how do we drive resources into centers that, that connect with people? Vice President Levine. Yes, Chair Omari and Regent McMillan. These particular centers are located in, their, in our office, in the Vice President for Research. That's why they're up here. Okay. They're, they're all interdisciplinary centers that report to our group. Okay. Um, there are other centers in the central <coughs> administration as well. The provost can address that, the kinds of centers that are in her portfolio as well. But there are many models that have been used across the country of how you set up these interdisciplinary centers. Um, for example, at Duke, they have a vice provost for interdisciplinary studies, and those primary centers they're funding from a central perspective are there. But there are centers that can pop up because an individual gets a major grant from the National Institutes of Health. I was director of an obesity center for 20 years, and it was totally funded by the National Institute mm -hmm. of Health, not funded at all from the university except for space. 
So your restart, Chair Mari, yes. so your answer then is the resources are coming from elsewhere, but with ones that we have to make prioritizations about and fund, is there a way to identify centers and institutes that you think are you know, better at speaking science, better at connecting with the average Minnesotan, better at translating things for legislators, because that, that there's so much value to be had there. I just don't know where to start across that 370 that are now down to, what, 350. So I don't know, maybe I'm angling that at President Kaler. It seems like there's got to be some help for the board here in how you choose the most effective and best centers. Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Chair Omari. Centers, um, as the entire university serve our three missions in in different ways. Typically, centers are not um, aligned around uh, the teaching mission unless it's an enabling teaching to become more uh, efficient. So they, they, they're centered, no pun intended, in a research space or uh, or outreach. So the Center for Small Towns, for example, is designed uh, to really be a resource for small towns in Minnesota. Uh, who want governance or infrastructure or, or policy uh, guidance and, and best practices. Um, there's research there, but it's primarily outreach. Um, let's pick one here. Uh, the Institute of the Environment is the umbrella organization uh, for a broad range of environmental research topics. There is an outreach role there. So these all are, are strategically place, the system-wide strategic plan will let other campuses connect with them more effectively. Uh, but each one has their personality, their mission, and their balance that, that evolves recognizing the research versus outreach uh, components that are going to be different for each one. I don't know that that's a particularly good answer uh, for you, but they, um, they are aligned uh, around their mission, and naturally some are going to do more outreach and some are going to do more research. Regent Powell. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair Amari. Um, so I, I'm going to, I think, continue on maybe in the in the same vein as uh, Regent McMillan. I, I I know that we have terrific initiatives in this area. We've all seen, you know, different different ones and different pieces of this. They're really exciting, and I also think that. Um, the criteria that Provost Hansen laid out, um, the five the five criteria around need, expertise, impact, academic synergy, capacity for service, I think those are absolutely correct and um, you know really a, a helpful way to look at these and I think that you know I think that if somehow what I yearn for is to, you know just in terms of this theme of Regent McMillan's around how do we think about this strategically I mean I, I'm thinking out loud here but you know one I have a feeling that we have 25 or 30 or 40 or so, we have some number of programs that are, if you will, they're signature programs that absolutely ring the bell on high need, um, there's high expertise, and there's high impact. And we've had them for a while, and it would be, I think it'd be useful to know what those are. And probably you'd say, these are great. We're going to keep feeding them and supporting them because they have such a powerful impact on the state. And that would help, you know, my, you know, bucket, my help bucket. And then there's a second level of analysis, I think, that might say where, you know, as we think about this for this century to the question um, that was raised on how do we want to evolve it, I, I mean, you probably need to start to get into where are the needs statewide that we, I mean, there are zillions of them, but how do we get to four or five areas of need, maybe focusing on rural areas where we could have an impact? Um, and pro there's probably things that are already going on, but in other words, a, a level of analysis that says we're going to pick these five areas to try to, you know, leverage our expertise, see if we can have an impact here. I'm, I mean, this is a little, this isn't very articulate, but I, that's sort of, I, I'm, I think that these five criteria, if we use them as a tool or a matrix, can really help us start to think through where, what's the right strategic profile for what we want to do, and, and, and then just to repeat, and then I'll stop. And I, I know we've got a bunch of these that we would look at them and we'd say, these are, you know, what I would call these are signature super programs because they hit on all the criteria. Maybe the last thought is how much do we spend in this area? 
um, and it would, I think it would just be useful to know the how many the resources that we have to deploy as we think about it going forward. Thank you, Regent Powell. Uh, Mr. President uh, wants to take a stab at it. Uh, Chair Amari, Regent Powell, to your last answer, uh, the last time I looked uh, in our budget elements, and I think my friend Julie has gone back to work to make sure the <laughs> university runs, um, it's, it's hundreds of millions of dollars of spend is coded as related to outreach in one way, shape, or another. So it's a, it's a sort of potential for impact, capacity for service, academic synergy, community need, and university expertise. So, yeah, it's a, that's, that's why these are on this slide. That's what we do. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Provost Hanson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari. I just wanted to chime in a little bit on that, too, because the, the issue of the centers and, and the, the things that are funded out of our own resources um, is, is, a, is a special question of sort of the, the number of centers we have and the outreach that they do. And we, we may want to kind of par parse off the questions a little bit. The, the principles we proposed were for our, you know, in some sense, our own investment. But if we think about the um, the centers, even some of the enduring centers. I mean, the one that's left in my office right now is the Institute for Advanced Study. And sometimes people bring grants into that, but we also do support that out of O&M. But if, if you think of um, other kinds of or the Center for Drug Design or something like that. I mean, that's f that that arose out of um, a money that came to us because of the, the drugs that had Drug been design. uh, designed here, and it's it's it was funded in that way. Um, even even some things that you think about, like the Center for the Studies of the Pre-Modern World, which is something in you know kind of the more the humanities side, that's that's an important center for us, and and it's an important center socially. It has to do with the with with understanding how the divisions happen between uh, <coughs> the Islamic world and Christendom, and uh, and you know could could. Even though it's a, a, a recherche topic in some ways, it obviously has a lot of applicability now. But it's wholly funded by Mellon, and, and yet it does engage in some outreach. So there, 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 there's funding we could say goes into outreach activities because uh, that's the way the grant is written, and that's what it does. But that's different from the funding that comes out of our own, uh, you know, the O and M budget essentially. Thank you, Provost Hanson. And one thing I think would be interesting to think about, and I'm not looking for an answer on this, but you know, is is to apply these five principles. Uh, and I'm going to use the the opioid crisis that apparently is a new thing, but last I checked, has been around for about 50 years. Uh, people just started caring about it more recently. Uh, so how do we do that 50 years ago, before the larger narrative started? Right. So do we have areas where it's not being talked about at Congress or what have you that we can jump on to? Um, I'm not looking for an answer, though. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The um, Regent Powell uh, covered quite a bit of the turf that I, I was um, contemplating. The principles, uh, I, I, I think, are dead on. But much like research, gen or the re uh, excuse me, the outreach generally, um, it, this is such a subjective area. It's really hard. You know, unless you're talking about an extension agent talking to 268 farmers over the course of a year, it's hard to sort of identify where our outreach has, you know, the sort of the discrete um, objective data from which we can we can move. I when I, I think about this in terms of the 21st century outreach, uh, excuse me, uh, land grant mission compared to the, you know, 20th or 19th century um, land grant mission, you know, I think a lot about. It, you know, the agronomic impact of institutions like the University of Minnesota and how you came up with a more productive uh, strain of, of soybean, for instance, and then what's the process for delivering that to ensure all um, uh, producers have access to that technology to help the economy grow, to, to help Minnesota's development. And, you know, we can see in that area now the, the seed companies are now so far uh, in, in, entrenched in that that it, we, we play a bit of a different role. Um, when I think about outreach now and when you think about the community needs and the university expertise of you know, all these principles, um, we, it, you know, it, it's, I don't know that we've necessarily walked away from a lot of that, the, the original areas of development, uh, but we certainly are in a lot of new ones. Um, and one of the things that I, when I think about the outreach function and, and I think about the dollars, as, as uh, President Kaler was just talking about, 
that we that we spend on it. I, this seems to be a place where we can really take advantage of a lot of you know of the new world. I think about something as simple as YouTube and how much I've saved on plumbers and mechanics by being able to figure out something that in the past I would have had no capacity to do and in our ability to leverage uh, those technologies and, uh, and being able to uh, have very, very low cost access to the public. Um, and I know that these things are going on, but, but it just seems to me that this is a way that it maybe is a little bit less um, um, uh, you know, sort of personnel driven at times, you know, our capacity to, to, to disseminate this kind of information is, is really important. So I, when I think about the change in the, in the, in the land grant mission over the, over the period and, and bringing, bringing us up to the 21st century, and I think about the outreach function, it's, it's you know, keeping those things that are really effective. Um, I think there still is a desire to have, um, you know, the opportunity for on-site. You know, you, you talk about putting forward a program and it sells out immediately and you're at full capacity. So not everyone's ready to find everything on on, on the uh, interweb, but um, so th this is, I think, a really good conversation. But if we could find some way of quantifying some of these these principles in order to be able to make those analyses, I think that will help us with that investment question about that additional dollar that comes into the university. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, Regent Simonson. Yeah, thank you. I'm just onboarded, so I'm getting caught up, so apologize if, uh, if uh, the questions don't uh, make a lot of sense. But first of all, on the opioid thing, I really appreciate you doing that. And the, that was one of the four pillars presented by Dean Toller a couple of weeks ago, and I'm really supportive of that and what it can do for our state. With regards to the uh, uh, economic uh, or technology com commercialization, is this min drive measured performance? Is that Minnesota or that's... Vice President Lewis. Yeah, Chair Omari, Regent Simonson. Yes, it, it was funding that was given by the state for the purpose of doing work okay. that was highly related to state efforts and state needs. And, and, and that's where we have focused all of our efforts. Okay, and so starting um, 120 companies, is there a way to quantify that for Minnesota? What's the return? Well, we'd have, we've looked at return on investment on some of these issues that are very high, but specifically on each of those companies, I'd have to look that up. I can get back to you on it. Okay. And then last question. Uh, I've worked with a number of universities throughout the country and internationally as well, and especially here in the United States, I see a lot of them moving towards moving the, before they outlicense the technology, the universities. They're moving it, I call it R1, R2, R3, D1, D2, D3, before, and a lot of it gets outlicensed at an R1 stage, undervalued, in my opinion. I've seen it happen here at the University of Minnesota. And so is there anything like uh, that we're doing? I, I was just working with North Carolina, for example. They set up uh, enterprise or, uh, be, uh, development laboratories there to help in-state companies take technology further and, and to work closer with the university. Anything, and I was just recently working with the veterinary college trying to get them to do this, where they could move the technology to a more value before they outlicense it. I don't know if that makes sense to you. And are you working with the University Enterprise Lab at all? Yeah. Vice President Levine. Chair Omari, Regent Simonson. Yes, so we have discovery capital that goes into funding new, new companies and outsourcing. We also are working more and more on the accelerator incubator part of this as well. And that's why I talked about that nexus space and some of that. And yes, we do some work with UEL, University and Enterprise Laboratories as well over the years. Well, it's something I'll be very interested in seeing that. Type. Sorry, Chair, I didn't acknowledge you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, yeah, the issue with outreach is that um, it's so dispersed. Um, it's virtually impossible to roll it up and aggregate numbers. The, the, the returns and the impacts are all individual stories. But to try to try to put a bow around it is some universities have tried that, and that those data sets are are, are poor. And, and so I wouldn't want us wasting time on on uh, an exercise that isn't going to work. But I think a visual that I. I think it would be helpful to be able to, with a communication piece to match up what the state's needs are in one column and what we're doing on the other. Because we know we're in that business, whether it's opioids or aquatic 
uh, invasive species or agriculture or achievement opportunity gap, but it, taking the top 10 state needs, whatever those are and whatever those they could agree on, and matching those up with our, it, it's just a, side by side, what are we doing? And I th think people would be impressed. Maybe there's some gaps though. Yeah. I think we are more, our outreach and our research is more local than it was when I joined the board. Min Drive has forced that. Uh, I think that's what the legislature told us they wanted us to do, and I think it's had that desired effect. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Omari. Thank you, presenters. Um, at the risk of repeating myself, um, I'm going to anyway, because that's, I learned that in communications class. The more you repeat something, the more you <coughs> pick up. But uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, regarding the uh, admissions discussion, I think, I think we should be levering our athletics programs um, to try and reach people, because that's how we reach the most people, um, whether it's in the state or you know beyond the state. And I don't know if we can do more. I don't know how much inventory we control in terms of advertising that occurs either in stadiums or you know, uh, while, during games while we're playing. But I think there, there have to be opportunities to, and I know we do have like a little video that we play during sporting events that uh, shows what we do on the academic side of the house. But I think we should be leveraging that as well as the social media behind it. Um, and then also the, I've mentioned before, you know, the U experts thing where, um, you know, when something happens in the world, we put our experts out there and we, we make it easy for media, because media is basically lazy, right? So we, we put it out, there aren't any in the room right here. Um, if we put it out there and we make it easy for them to get a hold of one of our experts, it gets us out there, it's free, you know, it takes a little bit of time point them to stuff that um, our experts have done. Uh, just you know, one example I can remember off the top of my head is uh, Richard Painter from uh, our law school. And I'm gonna spin the law school in a different way now. Uh, but he's, you know, he's been the expert in, in terms of White House ethics. Is, you know, he worked there one time uh, during the Bush administration. And I just think uh, you know, the more we do of that, the, the higher our profile is gonna go and you know, it's gonna help the law school you know, because the, the rankings uh, actually rank, you know, how people see us uh, as peers and also lawyers and judges. So that's an example of the law school, but there are plenty of examples in medicine and science and um, you name it. And I just think uh, we, we, we should be trying to figure out how to do that uh, better and uh, more effectively. And of course, you know, every time I turn on the TV and it's local news and they're talking about something, I expect to see a University of Minnesota expert on there, not a St. Thomas expert, not, not uh, a Minsky expert. So anyway, I think that's uh, something that uh, we can do using um, technology and um, social media uh, to get our name out there. Thank you, Regent Shu. It sounds like we're, we're in many ways marrying the two uh, that were so uh, well defined in the in the docket material of the outreach as effective messaging uh, combined with this engagement slash outreach reciprocal work with the community research and delivering it and so on and so forth uh, that we might be able to marry the two to, to get at um, what some of Regent Shu is, is commenting on. Anything you, you, you either of you want to mention uh, to that point from Regent Shu? Uh, Regent Anderson is going to bring this item to a close, please. Uh, thank you, Regent Omari, Chair Omari. I was just going to say, uh, Regent Shu, and, and I know you know about this, but you probably forgot. You know, the Minnesota Sparks program, we started about three years ago. I go to most of those events in greater Minnesota. That's what brought me to Worthington. It was actually Randy hosted it well before he was a regent. And um, we are getting out with some of these experts and doing that, and I, I totally agree. The more we can do that, the more it's great. Uh, I would tell any of my colleagues at some time, I love to go down to the second floor and see what OTC has going. It's just I'm an entrepreneurial type guy and I love to stop down there and visit with the folks. I would suggest any of you should stop down there and see what they're doing and the companies they're rolling out. Would that be a, uh, I think, I don't know if, we, if uh, Senior Vice President Levine mentioned this, but I think he said we were six in the in the world or something in that. But did, weren't we ranked second in the country or something too? It depends on the rank. Chair Mario, for the amount of dollars involved yeah. in the community developed right. from the Office of Technology in the University. So, anyway, that was my point. 
was giving him a shot off. Thank you, Regent Anderson. Uh, with that, thank you to the presenters. Uh, thank you. We will continue to be having some of these conversations as time goes on. Um, I'll now turn um, to the consent report and have Karen Hansen uh, mention anything that you'd like to talk about from that perspective, uh, Madam Provost, and then we'll entertain a motion. Uh, thank you, Chair Amari. Yeah, you've seen the consent report. The medical school is assuming administrative responsibility for a fellowship in partnership with Korea Orthopedic Center. This fellowship has existed for a while, but the University of Minnesota is assuming ownership of TRIA as a financial partner. If the funding ceases, the, we'll reevaluate the um, fellowship continuation. Um, CLA is, is on the Twin Cities campus, the College of Liberal Arts is, is um, creating a Master of Arts degree in Asian Studies and a Master of Science in Cognitive Science. That how it is intended solely to be a terminal degree for those who are in in the PhD program, it's not a standalone. College of Liberal Arts and the Science of Engineering are creating a graduate minor in translational sensory sciences. I want to highlight a couple of these where there are cross school things because that's actually um, executing on our campus strategic plan. Another one is the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences, the College of Veterinary Medicine, and the School of Public Health, post baccalaureate certificate in integrated food systems leadership. Um, in addition, College of Education and Human Development is creating an undergraduate minor in learning technologies. The College of Liberal Arts in Duluth is creating a graduate minor in American Indian Studies. A bunch of other program changes and sub plans, name changes, and so on uh, indicated in your docket. Uh, and we have some discontinuations as well. As you'll also note, the consent report contains a tenure conferral for four professors. Their names, ranks, and, uh, and a brief bio for each is included in your docket materials. And you, I, I perhaps should just call out, because otherwise it may seem odd, that uh, there's a request for tenure approval of Sophia Vinogradov, whom you've ha had here. Um, she's been in her position for some time, um, but uh, I did approve her tenure in January to bring it to, to you, but the, this is the formal completion of that process to, to bring it to you for approval. She was an outside hire. Uh, I'll first entertain a motion and second and then any discussion. So moved. Second. It's moved and second. Any discussion and comments? Seeing none, uh, I will call for a vote. All those in favor? All right. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, information items. Provost Hanson. Thank you, Chair Amari. One that uh, is important given the, the discussion we just had, well, we, we could highlight uh, student, faculty, and staff accomplishments there, and I think that's always cheering to read that. Um, but there is also an update on research startups and technology commercialization that uh, Al's office provided. So, so that's an important thing to take a look at, too. Thank you, Provost Hanson, and I encourage you all to take a look at that uh, report that was prepared for us. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to call on Regent Swigum to just point out the time, please. <laughs> because at uh, 4.33, uh, I call for uh, adjournment. Thank you. <laughs> We're adjourned. So moved. <laughs> Thank you. You talked to Andrew. 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 Andrew.